This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information for how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Poems by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read by Linda Liu. Editor's Preface to Notes. Katharina. Hunc librum. Qui fili eus. Caresimi. Poetae. Tabitam ingenio laudam expectantis, serum tamen monumentum esset annum aetatis non aginta octo agenti, veteris amicitiae pignus. R.B. An editor of posthumous work is bounded to give some account of the authority for his text, and it is the purpose of the following notes to satisfy inquiry concerning matters whereof the present editor has the advantage of first-hand or particular knowledge. The sources are four, and will be distinguished as capital A, B, D, and H, as here described. Capital A is my own collection, a manuscript book made up of autographs, by which word I denote poems in the author's handwriting, pasted into it as they were received from him, and also contemporary copies of other poems. These autographs and copies date from 67 to 89, the year of his death. Editions made by copying after that date are not reckoned or used. The first two items of the facsimiles are cuttings from A. Capital B is a manuscript book into which, in 83, I copied from capital A certain poems of which the author had kept no copy. He was remiss in making fair copies of his work, and his autograph of the Dutchland having been seemingly lost. I copied that poem and others from capital A at his request. After that date, he entered more poems in this book as he completed them, and he also made both corrections of copy and emendations of the poems which had been copied into it by me. Thus, if a poem occur in both capital A and capital B, then capital B is a later end, except for overlooked errors of copyist, the better authority. The last entry written by G. M. H. into this book is of the date 1887. Capital D is a collection of the author's letters to Canon Dixon, the only other friend who ever read his poems, with but few exceptions, whether of persons or of poems. These letters are in my keeping. They contain autographs of a few poems with late corrections. Capital H is a bundle of posthumous papers that came into my hands at the author's death. These were at the time examined, sorted, and indexed, and the more important pieces, of which copies were taken, were inserted into a scrapbook. That collection is a source of a series of his most mature sonnets, and of almost all the unfinished poems and fragments. Among these papers were also some early drafts. The facsimiles, lower case A and lower case B, are from H. The latest autographs and autographic corrections have been preferred. In the very few instances in which this principle was overruled, as in numbers 1 and 27, the justification will be found in the note to the poem. The finished poems, from 1 to 51, are arranged chronologically by the years, but in the sections 52 to 74, a fanciful grouping of the fragments were preferred to the inevitable misrepresentations of conjectural dating. G.M.H. dated his poems from their inception, and however much he revised a poem, he would date his recast as his first draft. Thus, Handsome Heart was written and sent to me in 79, and the recast which I reject was not made before 83, 
while the final corrections may be some years later. And yet his last autograph is dated as a first. Oxford, 79. This edition purports to convey all the author's serious mature poems, and he would probably not have wished any of his earlier poems, nor so many of his fragments, to have been included. Of the former class, three specimens only are admitted and these, which may be considered of exceptional merit or interest, had already been given to the public, but of the latter almost everything, because these scraps, being of mature date, generally contain some special beauty of thought or diction, and are invariably of metrical or rhythmical interest. Some of them are in this respect as remarkable as anything in the volume, as for exclusion, no translations of any kind are published here, whether into Greek or Latin from the English, of which there are autographs and copies in capital A, or the Englishing of Latin hymns occurring in capital H. These last are not, in my opinion, of special merit, and with them I class a few religious pieces which will be noticed later. Of the peculiar scheme of prosody invented and developed by the author, a full account is out of the question. His own preface, together with his description of the metrical scheme of each poem, which is always wherever it exists, transcribed in the notes, may be a sufficient guide for practical purposes. Moreover, the intention of the rhythm, in places where it might seem doubtful, has been indicated by accents printed over the determining syllables. In the later poems, these accents correspond generally with the author's own marks. In the earlier poems, they do not, but are trustworthy translations. It was at one time the author's practice to use a very elaborate system of marks, all indicating the speech movement, the autograph in capital A, of Harry Plowman, carries seven different marks, each one defined at the foot. When reading through his letters for the purpose of determining dates, I noted a few sentences on the subject which will justify the method that I have followed in the text. In 1883 he wrote, quote, You were right to leave out the marks. They were not consistent for one thing and are always offensive. Still there must be some. Either I must invent a notation applied throughout, as in music, or else I must only mark where the reader is likely to mistake. And for the present, this is what I shall do. Unquote. And again in 85, quote, This is my difficulty. What marks to use and when to use them? There is so much needed and yet so objectionable. About punctuation my mind is clear. I can give a rule for everything I write myself, and even for other people, though they might not agree with me, perhaps. Unquote. In this last matter, the autographs are rigidly respected, the rare intentional aberration being scrupulously noted and so I have respected his indentation of the verse. But in the sonnets, while my indentation corresponds, as a rule, with some autograph, I felt free to consider conveniences, following, however, his growing practice to skew it altogether. Apart from questions of taste, and if these poems were to be arraigned for errors, and what he may call taste, they might be convicted of occasional affectation and metaphor, as where the hills are, quote, as a stallion stalwart, very violet sweet, unquote, or of some perversion of human feeling, as, for instance, the, quote, nostrils relish of incense along the sanctuary side, unquote, or, quote, the Holy Ghost with warm breast and with, ah, bright wings, unquote. 
These and a few such examples are mostly efforts to force emotion into theological or sectarian channels, as in, quote, the comfortless, unconfessed, unquote, and the unpoetic line, quote, his mystery must be unstressed, stressed, unquote, or again, the exaggerated Marianism of some pieces, or the naked encounter of sensualism and asceticism, which hurts the, quote, golden echo, unquote. Apart, I say, from the such faults of taste, which few as they numerically are yet affect my liking, and more repel my sympathy than do all the rude shocks of his purely artistic wantonness. Apart from these, there are definite faults of style which a reader must have courage to face, and must in some measure condone before he can discover the great beauties. For these blemishes in the poet's style are of such quality and magnitude as to deny him even a hearing from those who love a continuous literary decorum, and are grown to be intolerant of its absence. And it is well to be clear that there is no pretense to reverse the condemnation of those faults for which the poet has duly suffered. The extravagances are and will remain what they were, nor can credit be gained from pointing them out. Yet to put readers at their ease, I will here define them. They may be called oddity and obscurity, and since the first may provoke laughter when a writer is serious, and this poet is always serious, while the latter must prevent him from being understood, and this poet has always something to say, it may be assumed that they were not a part of his intention. Something of what he thought on the subject may be seen in the following extracts from his letters. In February 1879 he wrote, quote, All, therefore, that I think of doing is to keep my verses together in one place. At present I have not even correct copies. That, if anyone should like, they might be published after my death and that again is unlikely, as well as remote. No doubt my poetry errs on the side of oddness. I hope in time to have a more balanced and Miltonic style. But as air, melody is what strikes me most of all in music, and design in painting. So design, pattern, or what I am in the habit of calling inscape, is what I, above all, aim at in poetry. Now it is a virtue of design, pattern, or inscape to be distinctive, and it is a vice of distinctiveness to become queer. This vice I cannot have escaped. Unquote. And again two months later, quote, Moreover, the oddness may make them repulsive at first, and yet Lang might have liked them on a second reading. Indeed, when, on somebody returning me the Eurydice, I opened and read some lines, as one commonly reads whether prose or verse, with the eyes, so to say, only it struck me aghast with a kind of raw nakedness and unmitigated violence I was unprepared for. But take breath, and read it with the ears, as I always wish to be read, and my verse becomes all right. Unquote. As regards oddity, then, it is plain that the poet was himself fully alive to it, but he was not sufficiently aware of his obscurity, and he could not understand why his friends found his sentences so difficult. He would never have believed that among all the ellipses and liberties of his grammar. The one chief cause is his habitual omission of the relative pronoun. And yet this is so, and the examination of a simple example or two may serve a general purpose. This grammatical liberty, 
though it is a common convenience in conversation, and is therefore its proper place in good writing, is apt to confuse the parts of speech and to reduce the normal sequence of words to mere jargon. Writers who carelessly rely on their elliptical speech forms to govern the elaborate sentences of their literary composition little know what a conscious effort of interpretation they often impose on their readers. But it was not carelessness in Gerard Hopkins. He had full skill in practice and scholarship in conventional forms and it is easy to see that he banished these purely constructional syllables from his verse, because they took up room which he thought he could not afford them. He needed his scheme all his space for his poetical words, and he wished those to crowd out every nearly grammatical colorless or toneless element, and so when he had gone into the habit of doing without these relative pronouns, Though he must, I suppose, have supplied them in his thought, he abuses the license beyond precedent, as when he writes, number 17, quote, O hero savest, unquote, for, quote, O hero that savest, unquote. Another example of this, from the fifth stanza of number 23, will discover another cause of obscurity. The line, quote, Squander the hell rook ranks Sally to molest him, unquote, means, quote, Scatter the ranks at Sally to molest him, unquote. But since the words squander and Sally occupy similar positions in the two sections of the verse and are enforced by similar accentuation, the second verb, deprived of its pronoun, will follow the first and appear as an imperative. And there is nothing to prevent its being so taken but the contradiction that it makes in the meaning. Whereas the grammar should expose and enforce the meaning, not have to be determined by the meaning. Moreover, there is no way of enunciating this line which will avoid the confusion because if, knowing that Sally should not have the same intonation as squander, the reader mitigates the accent, and in doing so, lessens or obliterate the Cicero pause which exposes its accent, then ranks becomes a genitive, and Sally a substantive. Here, then, is another source of the poet's obscurity, that in aiming at condensation, he neglects the need that there is for care in the placing of words that are grammatically ambiguous. English swarms with words that have one identical form for substantive, adjective, and verb, and such a word should never be so placed as to allow of any doubt as to what part of speech it is used for, because such ambiguity or momentary uncertainty destroys the force of the sentence. Now our author not only neglects this essential propriety, but he would seem even to welcome and seek artistic effort in the consequent confusion, and he will sometimes so arrange such words that a reader looking for a verb may find that he has two or three ambiguous monosyllables from which to select, and must be in doubt as to which promises best to give any meaning that he can welcome. And then, after his choice is made, he may be left with some homeless monosyllable still on his hands. Nor is our author apparently sensitive to the irrelevant suggestions that our numerous homophones cause, and he will provoke further ambiguities or obscurities by straining the meaning of these unfortunate words. Finally, the rhymes where they are peculiar are often repellent, and so far from adding charm to the verse that they appear as obstacles. This must not blind one from recognizing that Gerard Hopkins, where he is simple and straightforward in his rhyme, is a master of it. There are many instances, but when he indulges in freaks, 
His childishness is incredible. His intention in such places is that the verses should be recited running on without pause, and the rhyme occurring in their midst should be like a phonetic accident, merely satisfying the prescribed form. But his phonetic rhymes are often indefensible on his own principle. The rhyme to communion in The Buglers is hideous, and the suspicion that the poet thought it ingenuous is appalling. Eternal, in the Eurydice, does not correspond with burn all, and in Felix Randall, and some, and handsome, is as truly an eye rhyme as the love and proof which he despised and abjured. And it is more distressing because the old-fashioned conventional eye rhymes are accepted as such without speech adaptation and to many ears are a pleasant relief from the fixed jingle of the perfect rhyme. Whereas his false ear rhymes ask to have their slight but indispensable differences obliterated in the reading, and thus they expose their defect which is of a disagreeable and vulgar or even comic quality. He did not escape full criticism and ample ridicule for such things in his lifetime. And in 83 he wrote, quote, Some of my rhymes I regret, but they are past changing. Grumps and amber. There are only a few of these. Others are unassailable. Some others, again, they are which malignity may munch at, but the muse is law. Unquote. Now these are bad faults, and, as I said, a reader, if he is to get any enjoyment from the author's genius, must be somewhat tolerant of them, and they have a real relation to the means whereby the very forcible and original effects of beauty are produced. There is nothing stranger in these poems than the mixture of passages of extreme delicacy and exquisite diction with passages where, in a jungle of rough root words, emphasis seems to oust euphony, and both these qualities, emphasis and euphony, appear in their extreme forms. It was an idiosyncrasy of this student's mind to push everything to its logical extreme and take pleasure in a paradoxical result, as may be seen in his prosody where a simple theory seems to be used only as a basis for unexemplified liberty. He was flattered when I called him Greek letters Pi, Epsilon, Rho, Lambda, Tau, Tau, Delta, Tau, Alpha, Tau, Omicron, Sigma, and saw the humor of it. One would expect to find in his work the force of emphatic condensation and the magic of melodious expression, both in their extreme forms. Now, since those who study style in itself must allow a proper place to the emphatic expression, this experiment which supplies us novel examples of success as a failure, should be full of interest, and such interest will promote tolerance. The fragment, C facsimile, lowercase a and lowercase b, is a draft of what appears to be an attempt to explain how an artist has not free will in his creation. He works out his own nature instinctively, as he happens to be made, and is irresponsible for the result. It is lamentable that Gerard Hopkins died, when to judge by his latest work, he was beginning to concentrate the force of all his luxuriant experiments in rhythm and diction, and castigate his art into a more reserved style. Few will read the terrible posthumous sonnets without such high admiration and respect for his poetical power, as must lead them to search out the rare masterly beauties that distinguish his work. 
End of Preface to Notes This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information for how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Poems by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read by Linda Liu. Part Zero. Author's Preface. Our generation is overpast, and they love legacy, Gerard, has lain coy in my home. As once thy heart was fain of shelter, When God's terror held thee fast, In life's wild wood, And beauty and sorrow aghast. Thy sainted sense trammeled in ghostly pain, Thy rare ill-broker talent in disdain, Yet love of Christ will win man's love at last. Hell wars without, but tear, while my hands gather thy book, I heard this wintry day, Thy spirit thank me in his young delight, Stepping again upon the yellow sands. Go forth, amidst our chaffinch flock display, Thy plumage of far wonder and heavenward flight. Chiswell, January 1918 The poems in this book Note 1. That is, the manuscript described in Editor's Preface is capital B. This preface does not apply to the early poems. End footnote. Are written some in running rhythm, the common rhythm in English use, some in sprung rhythm, and some in the mixture of the two. And those in the common rhythm are some counterpointed, some not. Common English rhythm, called running rhythm above, is measured by feet of either two or three syllables, and, putting aside the imperfect feet at the beginning and end of lines, and also some unusual measures in which feet seem to be paired together, and double or composite feet to arise, never more or less. Every foot has one principal stress or accent, and this, or the syllable it falls on, may be called the stress of the foot, and the other part, the one or two unaccented syllables, the slack. Feet, the rhythms made out of them, in which the stress comes first, are called falling feet and falling rhythms. Feet and rhythm in which the slack comes first are called rising feet and rhythms, and if the stress is between two slacks, there will be rocking feet and rhythms. These distinctions are real and true to nature, but for purposes of scanning, it is a great convenience to follow the example of music and take the stress always first, as the accent or the chief account always comes first in a musical bar. If this is done, there will be in common English verse only two possible feet, the so-called accentual trochee and dacto, and correspondingly only two possible uniform rhythms, the so-called trochaic and dactylic, but they may be mixed, and then what the Greeks called a lochaetic rhythm arises. These are the facts. And according to these, the scanning of ordinary, regularly written English verse is very simple indeed, and to bring in other principles is here unnecessary. But because verse written strictly in these feet, and by these principles, will become same and tame, poets brought in licenses and departures from rule to give variety, and especially when the natural rhythm is rising, is in the common ten-syllable or five-foot verse, rhymed or blank. These irregularities are chiefly reversed feet and reversed or counterpoint rhythm.
which two things are two steps or degrees of license in the same kind. By a reversed foot, I mean the putting stress where, to judge by the rest of the measure, the slack should be, and the slack or the stress, and this is done freely at the beginning of a line, and in the course of a line, after a pause, only scarcely ever in the second foot or place, and never in the last, unless when the poet designs some extraordinary effect, for these places are characteristic and sensitive, and cannot well be touched. But the reversal of the first foot, and of some middle foot, after a strong pause, is a thing so natural that our poets have generally done it, from Chaucer down, without remark, and it commonly passes unnoticed, cannot be said to amount to a formal change of rhythm, but rather is that irregularity that all natural growth and motion shows. If, however, the reversal is repeated in two feet running, especially so as to include the sensitive second foot, it must be due either to great want of ear, or else as a calculated effect, the superinducing or mounting of a new rhythm upon the old. And since the new or mounted rhythm is actually heard, and at the same time the mind naturally supplies the natural or standard foregoing rhythm, for we do not forget what the rhythm is that by rights we should be hearing. Two rhythms are, in some manner, running at once, and we have something answerable to counterpoint in music, which is two or more strains of tune going on together, and this is counterpoint rhythm. Of this kind of verse, Milton is a great master, and the choruses of Samsonagonistus are written throughout in it but with the disadvantage that he does not let the reader clearly know what the ground rhythm is meant to be, and so they have struck most readers as merely irregular. And in fact, if you counterpoint throughout, since one only of the counter-rhythms is actually heard, the other is really destroyed or cannot come to exist. What is written is one rhythm only, and probably sprung rhythm, of which I now speak. Sprung rhythm, as used in this book, is measured by feet of from one to four syllables regularly, and for particular effects any number of weak or slack syllables may be used. It has one stress, which falls on the only syllable if there is only one, if there are more, then scanning as above on the first, and so gives rise to four sorts of feet a monosyllable in the so-called accentual, trochee, dactyl, and the first peon, and there will be four corresponding natural rhythms, but nominally the feet are mixed, and any one may follow any other, and hence sprung rhythm differs from running rhythm in having or being only one nominal rhythm, a mixed or logoedic one, instead of three. But on the other hand, in having twice the flexibility of foot, so that any two stresses may either follow one another running, or be divided by one, two, or three slack syllables. But strict sprung rhythm cannot be counterpointed. In sprung rhythm, as in logoedic rhythm generally, the feet are assumed to be equally long or strong, and their seeming inequality is made up by pause or stressing. Remark also that it is natural in sprung rhythm for the lines to be rove over, that is, for the scanning of each line immediately to take up that of the one before, so that if the first has one or more syllables at its end, the other must have so many the less at its beginning. And, in fact, the scanning runs on without break from the beginning, say, of a stanza to the end, and all the stanzas is one long strain though written in lines asunder. Two licenses are natural to sprung rhythm. The one is rest, as in music, but of this an example is scarcely to be found in this book, unless in the echoes, second line. The other is hangers, or outrides, that is, one, two, or three slack syllables added to a foot, and not counting in the nominal scanning. 
They are so called because they seem to hang below the line, or ride forward or backward from it, in another dimension than the line itself, according to a principle needless to explain here. These outriding half-feet, or hangers, are marked by a loop underneath them, and plenty of them will be found. The other marks are easily understood, namely accents, where the reader might be in doubt which syllable should have the stress. Slurs, that is, loops over syllables, to tie them together into the time of one. Little loops at the end of a line, to show that the rhyme goes on the first letter of the next line. What in music are called pauses, to show that the syllable should be dwelt on. And twirls, to mark reversed or counterpointed rhythm. Note on the nature and history of sprung rhythm. Sprung rhythm is the most natural of things. For one, it is a rhythm of common speech and of written prose, when rhythm is perceived in them. Two, it is the rhythm of all but the most monotonously regular music, so that in the words of choruses and refrains, and in songs written closely to music, it arises. Three, it is found in nursery rhymes, weather saws, and so on because, however these may have been once made in running rhythm, the terminations having dropped off by the change of language, the stresses come together, and so the rhythm is sprung. 4. It arises in common verse, when reversed or counterpointed, for the same reason. But nevertheless, in spite of all this, and though Greek and Latin lyric verse, which is well known, and the old English verse seen in Pierce Plowman, or in Sprung Rhythm, and it has in fact ceased to be used since the Elizabethan age, Green being the last writer who can be said to have recognized it. For perhaps there was not, down to our days, a single even short poem in English in which Spring Rhythm is employed, not for single effects or in fixed places, but as the governing principle of the scansion. I say this because the contrary has been asserted. If it is otherwise, the poem should be cited. Some of the sonnets in this book are in five foot, some in six foot, or Alexandrian lines. Numbers thirteen and twenty-two are curdle sonnets. That is, they are constructed in proportions resembling those of the sonnet proper, namely six plus four instead of eight plus six with, however, a half-line tailpiece, so that the equation is rather 12 over 8 plus 9 over 2 equals 21 over 2, which equals 10.5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information for how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Polls by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read by Linda Liu. Part 0B. Editor's Notes to Author's Preface. Notes. Author's Preface. This is from Capital B and must have been written in 83 or not much later. The punctuation has been exactly followed except that I have added a comma after the word language, where the omission seemed an oversight. Rove over. This expression is used here to denote the running on of the sense and sound of the end of a verse into the beginning of the next, but this meaning is not easily to be found in the word. The two words, reeve, R-E-E-V-E, -E -E, perfect, rove, which is also a perfect, of rive, and reeve, R-E-A-V-E, -E, perfect, reft, are both used several times by G-M-H, but they are both spelt, reeve, R-E-A-V-E. -E. In the present context, rove and reaving occur in his letters, and the spelling reave, 
R E E V E in the Deutschland stanza twelve line eight is probably due to the copyists. There is no doubt that G M H had a wrong notion of the meaning of the nautical term reeve. R E E V E, poem thirty nine, line ten, the third passage where reeve, R E E V E, spelt R E A V E, occurs, and a nautical meaning is required. See the note there. Would be satisfied by splice. Open parentheses, nautical, close parentheses. And if this notion were influenced by weave, wove, that would describe the inner weaving of the verses. In the passage referred to in the Deutschland, reeve, r e e v e, is probably intended in its dialectical or common speech significance. C writes, quote, English dialect dictionary, unquote, where the first sense of the verb is to bring together the quote, gathers unquote, of address, and in this This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information for how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Poems by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read by Linda Liu. Part 1. Early Poems. Poem 1. For a Picture of St. Dorothea. I bear a basket lined with grass. I am so light. I am so fair, men must wonder as I pass, and at the basket that I bear, where in a newly drawn green litter, sweet flowers I carry, sweets for bitter, lilies I show you, lilies none, none in Caesar's gardens blow, and a quince in hand, not one is set upon your bows below. Not set, because their buds not spring, spring not, cause world is wintering. But these were found in the east and south, where winter is a clime forgot, the dew drop on the larkspur's mouth. Oh, should it then be quenched not? In starry water meads they drew, these drops. Which be they, stars or dew? Had she a quince in hand, yet gaze, rather it is the sizing moon. Lo, linked heavens with milky ways, that was her larkspur row. So soon, sphered so fast, sweet soul, we see, nor fruit. Nor flowers, nor Dorothy. Poem two. Heaven, haven. A nun takes a veil. I desire to go, where springs not fail, to fields where flies no sharp and sided hail, and the few lilies blow. And I have asked to be. Where no storms come, where the green swell is in the havens dumb, and out of the swing of the sea. Poem three, the habit of perfection. Elected silence, sing to me, and beat upon my warlet ear, pipe me to pastures still and be, music that I care to hear. Shape nothing, lips, be lovely, dumb. It is a shut, the curfew sent, from there where all surrenders come, which only makes you eloquent. Be shelled eyes with double dark, and find the uncreated light, 
this rock and reel which you remark, coils, keeps and teases simple sight. Palate, the hutch of tasty lust, desire not to be rinsed with wine. The can must be so sweet, the crust so fresh, the common fast divine. Nostrils, your careless breath that spend upon the stir and deep of pride. What relish shall the censor send along the sanctuary side? O oh, feel of primrose hands, O oh, feet that want the yield of plushy sward, but you shall walk the golden street, and you unhouse and house a lord. In poverty be thou the bride, now the marriage feast begun, and lily colored clothes provide. Your spouse not labored at, nor spun. End of early poems. Poems, 1876 to 1889. Poem 4. The Wreck of the Deutschland. To the happy memory of five Franciscan nuns, exiles by the Falk laws, drowned between midnight and morning of December 7th, 1875 Part the First One Thou mastering me, God, giver of breath and bread, world strand, sway of the sea, Lord of living and dead, Thou hast bound bones and veins in me, fastened me flesh, and after it, almost unmade, what with dread, thy doing, and thus thou touch me afresh, over again I feel thy finger, and find thee. 2. I did say yes, O oh, at lightning and lashed rod, thou heardest me truer than tongue confess, thy terror, O oh Christ, O oh God, thou knowest the walls, altar, an hour and night, the swoon of a heart that the sweep and the hurl of thee trod, hard down with a horror of height, and the midriff a strain with leaning of, laced with fire of stress. 3. The frown of his face before me, the hurdle of hell behind, where where was a, where was a place? I whirled out wings at spell, And fled with a fling of the heart To the heart of the host, my heart, But you were dove-winged, I can tell. Carrier witted, I am bold to boast, To flash from the flame to the flame then, Tower from the grace to the grace, for I am soft to sift in an hour glass at the wall fast, but mind with emotion adrift, and it crowds and it combs to the fall. I steady as a water in a well to a poise, to a pain, but roped with always. All the way down from the tall Fells or flanks of the bowl A vein of the gospel proffer A pressure, a principle Christ's gift Five I kiss my hand to the stars Lovely asunder, starlight Wafting him out of it And glow Glory and thunder, kiss my hand to the dappled with dams and west, since, though he is under the world's splendor and wonder, his mystery must be in stress, stressed, for I greet him the days I meet him, and bless when I understand. 6. Not out of his bliss, 
Springs the stress felt, Nor first from heaven, And few know this, Swings the stroke dealt. Stroke and a stress That stars and storms deliver, That guilt is hushed by, Hearts are flushed by and melt, But it rides time like riding a river, and here the faithful waver, the faithless fable and miss. 7. It dates from day of his going to Galilee, warm laid grave of a womb life gray, manger, maiden's knee, the dense and the driven passion in frightful sweat. Thence the discharge of it, There it's swelling to be. Though felt before, Though in high flood yet, What none would have known of it, Only the heart, Being hard at bay. 8. Is out with it, Oh, we lash with the best or worst word last, how a lush kept, plush capped slow will, mal to flesh burst, gush, flush the man, the being with it, sour or sweet, brim, in a flash, fool, hither then, last or first, to hero of Calvary, Christ's feet. Never ask if meaning it, wanting it, warned of it, men go. 9. Be adored among men, God, three-numbered form. Ring thy rebel, dogged in den, man's malice with wrecking and storm, beyond saying sweet. Past telling of tongue, Thou art lightning in love, I found it, A winter and warm, Father and fondler of heart, Thou hast wrung, Hast thy dark descending, And most art merciful then. 10. With an anvil ding, And with fire in him forge thy will, or rather, rather than stealing a spring through him, melt him but master him still, whether at once, as once at a crash pall, or as Austin, a lingering out sweet skill, make mercy in all of us, out of us all mastery, but be adored. But be adored, King. Part the Second Eleven Some find me a sword, Some the flange and the rail, Flame, fang, or flood goes death on drum, And storms bugle his fame. But we dream we are rooted in earth, Dust. Flesh falls within sight of us, We, though our flower the same, Wave with the meadow, Forget that there must The sour skies cringe, And the blear share come. 12. On Saturday sailed from Bremen, American outward bound, Take settler and seaman, Tell men with woman, Two hundred souls in the round, O oh, Father, not under thy feathers, Nor ever as guessing, The goal was a shoal, Of a fourth the doom to be drowned, Yet did the dark side of the bay of thy blessing Not fault them, The million of rounds of thy mercy, Not breathe even them in. Thirteen. Into the snows she sweeps, Hurling the haven behind, The Deutschland on Sunday, 
and so the sky keeps for the infinite air is unkind and the sea flint flake black backed in the regular blow sitting east northeast in cursed quarter the wind wiry and white fury and whirlwind swivel at snow spins to the widow making unchilding unfathering deeps fourteen she drove in the dark to leeward she struck not a reef or a rock but the combs of a smother of sand night drew her dead to the kentish knock and she beat the bank down with her bows and the ride of her keel the breakers rolled on her beam with ruinous shock and canvas and compass the whorl and the wheel idle forever to waft her or wind her with these she endured fifteen hope had grown gray hairs hope had mourning on trenched with tears carved with cares hope was twelve hours gone and frightful a nightfall folded rueful a day nor rescue only rocket and light ship shone and lives at last were washing away to the shrouds they took they shook in the hurling and horrible airs sixteen one stirred from the rigging to save the wild womankind below with a rope's end round the man handy and brave he was pitched to his death at a blow for all his dread not breast and braids of though they could tell him for hours dandled the to and fro through the cobbled foam fleece what could he do with the burl of the fountains of air bach and the flood of the wave seventeen they fought with god's cold and they could not and fell to the deck crushed them or water and drowned them or rolled with a sea romp over the wreck night roared with a heartbreak hearing a heartbroke rabble the woman's wailing the crying of child without check till a lioness arose breasting the babel a prophetess towered in the tumult a virginal tongue told eighteen ah touched in your bower of bone are you turned for an exquisite smart have you make words break for me here all alone do you mother of being in me heart Oh, unteachably after evil, but uttering truth, why tears is it? Tears, such a melting, a magical start, never eldering revel and river of youth. What can it be, this glee, the good you have there of your own? Nineteen, sister, a sister calling a master her master and mine in the inboard seas run swirling and hauling the rash smart sloggering brine blinds her but she that weather sees one thing one has one fetch in her she rears herself to divine ears and the call of the tall nun to the men in the tops and the tackle rode over the storms brawling twenty she was first of a five and came of a coifed sisterhood o oh, deutschland double a desperate name a world wide of its good but gertrude lily and luther are two of a town 
Christ lily and beast of the waste wood. From life's dawn it is drawn down, Abel as Cain's brother, and breasts they have sunk the same. 21. Loath for a love men knew in them, Bound by the land of their birth, Rhine refused them, Thames would ruin them, Surf, snow, river and earth, Gnashed, but thou art above, Thou orion of light, Thy unchanceling poising palms Were weighing the worth, Thou martyr master, In thy sight, Storm flakes were scroll-leaved flowers, lily showers, sweet heaven was a strew in them. 22. 5. The finding and sake in cipher of suffering Christ. Mark, the mark is of man's make, and the word of it, sacrifice. But he scores it in scarlet himself on his own bespoken, Before time taken, dearest prized and priced, Stigma, signal, sinkfoil token, For lettering of the lamb's fleece, Ruddying of the rose flake. 23. Joy fall to thee, Father Francis, Drawn to the life that died, With the gnarls of the nails in thee, Niche of the lance, His love-scape crucified, And seal of the seraph arrival, And these thy daughters, And five livid and leavid, Favor and pride, Are sisterly sealed in wild waters, to bathe in his fall gold mercies, To breathe in his all fire glances. 24. Away in the lovable west, On a pastoral forehead of Wales, I was under a roof here, I was at rest, And they the prey of the gales, She to the black about air, To the breaker, the thickly falling flakes To the throng that catches and quails Was calling, O oh Christ, Christ, come quickly The cross to her she calls Christ to her Christians her wild worst best 25. The majesty, what did she mean? Breathe Arch and original breath, Is it love in her of the being As her lover had been? Breathe, body of lovely death, They were else minded then, Altogether, the men woke thee with a We are perishing in the weather of a Nesseret. Or is it that she cried for the crown then, the keener to come at the comfort For feeling the combating keen. 26. For how the heart's cheering The down dog, ground hard gray, Hope resolve, the jay blue heavens appearing Of pied and peeled may, Blue beating in hoary glow height or night. Still higher, with bell fire and the moth soft milky way, what by your measure is a heaven of desire? The treasure never eyesight got, nor was ever guessed what for the hearing. Twenty seven. No, but it was not these, the jading and jar of the cart. Time's tasking, it is father's in asking for ease of the sodden with its sorrowing heart, not danger, electrical horror, 
then further it finds the appealing of the passion is tender in prayer apart other i gather in measure her mind's burden in winds burly and beat of indragonate seas twenty eight but how shall i make me room here reach me a fancy come faster strike you the side of it look at it loom there thing that she there then the master ipsy the only one christ king head he was to cure the extremity where he had cast her to deal lord it with living and dead let him ride her pride in his triumph dispatch and have done with his doom there twenty nine ah there was a heart right there was single eye read the unshapable shock night and knew the who and the why wording it how but by him that present and past heaven and earth are word of worded by the simon peter of a soul to the blast tarpian fast but a blown beacon of light thirty jesu heart's light jesu made sun what was the feast followed the night thou hadst glory of this nun feast of the one woman without stain for so conceive it so to conceive thee is done but here was heart throw birth of a brain word that heard and kept thee and uttered thee outright thirty one well she has thee for the pain for the patience but pity of the rest of them heart go and bleed at a bitterer vein for the comfortless unconfessed of them no not uncomforted lovely felicitious providence finger of a tender of oh of a feathery delicacy the breast of the maiden could obey so be a bell to ring of it and startle the poor sheep back is a shipwreck then a harvest does tempest carry the grain for thee thirty two i admire thee master of the tides of the your flood of the year's fall the recurb and the recovery of the gulf sides the girth of it and the wharf of it and the wall staunching quenching ocean of emotionable mind ground of being and granite of it past all grasp god throned behind death with a sovereignty that heeds but hides bodes but abides thirty three with a mercy that outrides the all of water an ark for the listener for the linger with a love glides lower than death and the dark a vein for the visiting of the past prayer pent in prison the last breath penitent spirits the uttermost mark our passion plunged giant risen the christ of the father compassionate fetched in the storm of his strides thirty four now burn 
new-born to the world, doubled natured name, the heaven-flung, heart-fleshed, maiden furled, miracle in Mary of flame, mid-numbered, he in three of the thunder-throne, not a doomsday dazzle in his coming, nor dark as he came, kind, but royally reclaiming his own, a released shower, let flash to the shire, not a lightning of fire, hard hurled. 35. Dame at our door, drowned, and among our shoals, remember us in the road the heaven haven of the reward, our king back, oh, upon English souls, let him easter in us, be a day spring to the dimness of us, be a crimson cresseted east, more brightening her, rare dear Britain, as his reen rolls, pride, robes, Prince, hero of us, high priest, our hearts, charities, hearths, fire, our thoughts, chivalries, throngs, Lord. End of This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information for how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Poems by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read by Linda Liu. Part 1b. Editor's Notes to Early Poems. And Poem 4. Early Poems. Two school prize poems exist. The date of the first, quote, the Escorial, unquote, is Easter, 60, which is before GMH was 16 years old. It is in Spenserian stanza. The imperfect copy in another hand has the first 15 stanzas, omitting the ninth, and the author has written on it his motto. Greek phrase, capital beta, alpha, accented, Tau, Rho, Alpha, C, Omicron, Sigma, Space, Delta, Epsilon, Accented, Space, Pi, Omicron, Tau, Apostrophe, Space, Alpha, Accented, Mu, Rho, Iota, Accented, Delta, Alpha, Sigma, Space, aspirate omega, sigma, space, tau, iota, sigma, space, epsilon accented, rho, iota accented, sigma, delta, omega, with an accompanying gloss to explain his illusions, the wholly lacking the Byronic flash looks as if influenced by the historical descriptions in quote, Child Herald, unquote, and might provide a quotation for a tourist guide to Spain. The history seems competent, and the artistic knowledge precocious. Here, for a sample, is a seventh stanza. This was no classic temple ordered round, with massy pillars of the Doric mood, broad-fluted, nor with shafts a canthus crowned, portrayed along the frieze with titans brood, that battled gods for heaven, brilliant hued, with golden fillets and rich blazonry, wherein beneath a cornice horsemen rode with form divine, a fiery chivalry, triumph of airy grace, and perfect harmony. The second prize poem, Quote, a vision of mermaids, unquote, 
is dated Xmas 62. The autograph of this, which is preserved, is headed by a very elaborate circular pen and ink drawing, six inches in diameter. A sunset sea piece with rocks and formal groups of mermaidens, five or six together, singing as they stand apparently, half immersed in the shallows as described. Quote, but most in a half circle watch the sun, unquote, etc. This poem is in 143 lines of heroics. It betrays the influence of Keats, and when I introduced the author to the public in Miles's book, I quoted from it, thinking it useful to show that his difficult later style was not due to inability to excel in established forms. The poem is altogether above the standard of school prizes. I reprint the extract here. Soon, as when summer of his sister spring crushes and tears a rare and jeweling, and boasting, I have fairer things than these, plashes amidst the billowy apple trees his lusty hands in gusts of scented wind swirling out bloom till all the air is blind with rosy foam and pelting blossom and mist of driving vermeil rain and as he lists the dainty onyx coronals to flowers a glorious wanton all the wrecks and showers crowd down upon a stream and jostling thick with bubbles bugle-eyed struggle and stick on tangled shoals that bar the brook a crowd of filmy globes and rosy floating cloud so those mermaidens crowded to my rock but most in a half-circle watched the sun and a sweet sadness dwelt on every one i knew not why but know that sadness dwells in mermaids, whether that they bring the knells of seamen whelmed in chasms of the mid-main, as poets sing, or that it is a pain to know the dust depths of the ponderous sea, the miles profound of solid green, and below the cold fishes far from man, or what? I know the sadness, but the cause know not. Then they... Thus ranged, Gan make fool plaintively, A piteous siren sweetness on the sea, Without an instrument, Or conch or bell, Or stretched chords tunable on turtle's shell, Only with utterance a sweet breath they sung, In an antique chaunt, And in an unknown tongue, Now melting upward through the sloping scale, Swelled the sweet strain to a melodious wail, Now ringing clarion clear to whence it rose, Slumbered at last in one sweet, deep, heartbroken close. 1862 to 1868 After the relics of his school poems Follow the poems written when an undergraduate at Oxford, Of which there are four in this book. Poems 1 2, 3, and 52, all dating about 1866. Of this period, some ten or twelve autograph poems exist, the most successful being religious verses worked in Geo. Herbert's manner in these, I think, have been printed. There are two sonnets in Italian form and Shakespearean mood, refused by, quote, Cornhill Magazine, unquote. The rest are attempts at lyrical poems, mostly sentimental aspects of death. One of them, quote, Winter with a Gulf Stream, unquote, was published in, quote, Once a Week, unquote, and reprinted, at least in part, in some magazine. The autograph copy is dated August 1871, but G.M.H. told me that he wrote it when he was at school whence I guess that he altered it too much to allow of its early dating. The following is a specimen of his signature at this date. Picture of Signature Jard M. Hopkins July 24th, 1866 1868-1875 to 
After these last-mentioned poems, there is a gap of silence which may be accounted for in his own words, from a letter to R. W. D., October 5th, 78. Quote, what verses I had written I burnt before I became a Jesuit, i.e., 1868, and resolved to write no more, as not belonging to my profession, unless it were by the wish of my superiors. So for seven years I wrote nothing but two or three little presentation pieces, which occasion called for. But when in the winter of seventy-five the Deutschland was wrecked, in the mouth of the Thames and five Franciscan nuns, exiles from Germany by the Falk laws, aboard of her were drowned, I was affected by the account, and happening to say so to my rector, he said that he wished someone would write a poem on the subject. On this hint I set to work, and, though my hand was out at first, produced one. I had long had haunting my ear the echo of a new rhythm which now I realized on paper. I do not say the idea is altogether new, but no one has professedly used it and made it the principle throughout, that I know of. However, I had to mark the stresses, and a great many more oddnesses could not but dismay an editor's eye so that when I offered it to our magazine, The Month, they dared not print it. Unquote. Of the two or three presentation pieces here mentioned, one is certainly the Marian verses, quote, Rosa Mystica, unquote, published in the, quote, The Irish Monthly, unquote, May 98, and again in Orby Shipley's, quote, Carmina Mariana, unquote. Second series, page 183, The Autograph Another is supposed to be the, quote, Ad Mariam, unquote, printed in the, quote, Stonyhurst Magazine, unquote, February 94. This is in five stanzas of eight lines, in direct and competent imitation of Swinburne, no autograph has been found, and unless Father Hopkins's views of poetic form had been provisionally deranged or suspended, the verses can hardly be attributed to him without some impeachment of his sincerity. And that being altogether above suspicion, I would not yield to the rather strong presumption which their technical skill supplies in favor of his authorship. It is true that the, quote, Rosa Mystica, unquote, is somewhat in the same light, lilting manner, but that was probably common to most of these feastal verses. And, quote, Rosa Mystica, unquote, is not open to the positive objections of verbal criticism, which would reject the, quote, Ad Mariam, unquote. He never sent me any copy of either of these pieces, as he did of his severe Marian poems. Poems 18 and 37, nor mention them as productions of a serious muse. I do not find that in either class of these attempts he met with any appreciation at the time. It was after the publication of Miles's book in 1894 that his co-religionists began to recognize his possible merits. And their enthusiasm has not perhaps been always wise. It is natural that they should, as some of them openly state they do, prefer the poems that I am rejecting to those which I print. But this edition was undertaken in response to a demand that, both in England and America, has gradually grown up from the genuinely poetic interest felt in the poems which I have gradually introduced to the public. That interest has been no doubt welcomed and accompanied by the applause of his particular religious associates, but since that purpose is alien to mine, I regret that I am unable to indulge it. Nor can I put aside the overruling objection that G.M.H. would not have wished these little presentation pieces to be set among his more serious artistic work. I do not think they would please anyone who is likely to be pleased with this book. Poem 1 St. Dorothea Written when an exhibitioner at Balliol College Contemporary autograph in capital A, and another almost identical in H, both undated. 
Text from Capital A. This poem was afterwards expanded, shedding its relative pronouns to forty-eight lines divided among three speakers. Quote, An angel, the protonotary Theophilus, and a catechumen. Unquote. The grace and charm of original lost. There is an autograph in capital A, and other copies exist. This was the first of the poems that I saw, and GMH wrote it out for me, open parentheses, in 1866, question mark, close parentheses. Poem 2. Heaven, Haven. Contemporary autograph, on some page with last, in H. Text is from a slightly later autograph, undated, in capital A. The different copies vary. Poem 3. Habit of Perfection. Two autographs in capital A. The earlier dated January 18, 19, 1866. The second, which is a good deal altered, is apparently of same date as text of number 2. Text follows this later version, published in Miles. Poem 4. Rack of the Deutschland. Text from capital B. Title from capital A. See description of capital B on page 94. In the, quote, The Spirit of Man, unquote, the original first stanza is given from capital A and varies. Otherwise, capital B was not much corrected. Another transcript, now at St. Aloysius's College, Glasgow was made by Reverend F. Bacon after capital A, but before the correction of capital B. This was collated for me by the Reverend Father Geoffrey Bliss, S.J., and gave one true reading. Its variants are distinguished by G in the notes to the poem. The labor spent on this great metrical experiment must have served to establish the poet's prosody, and perhaps his diction. Therefore, the poem stands logically as well as chronologically in the front of his book, like a great dragon folded in the gate to forbid all entrance, and confident in his strength from past success. This editor advises the reader to circumvent him and attack him later in the rear, for he was himself shamefully worsted in a brave frontal assault, more easily perhaps because both subject and treatment were distasteful to him. A good method of approach is to read stanza 16 aloud to a chance company. To the metrist and rhythmist, the poem will be of interest from the first and throughout. Stanza 4, line 7. Father Bliss tells me that the vol, V-O-E-L, is a mountain not far from St. Bono's College in North Wales, where the poem was written and Dr. Henry Bradley, that mole, M-O-E-L, is primarily an adjective meaning bald. It becomes a feminine substitute meaning bare hill, and preceded by the article Y becomes bull, V-O-E-L, in modern Welsh, spelt F-O-E-L. This accounts for its being written without initial capital, the word being used generically, and the meaning obscured by roped, is that the well is fed by the trickles of water within the flanks of the mountains. Both capital A and capital B read planks for flanks. G gives the correction. Stanza 11 Line 5. Two of the required stresses are on we dream. Stanza 12. Line 8. Reeve. R-E-E-V-E. -E -E. See note on author's preface. Stanza 14. Line 8. These. G has there. But the words between shock, and these are probably parenthetical. 
stanza 16, line 3. Landsmen may not observe the wrongness. See again poem 17, stanza 9, and poem 39, line 10. I would have corrected this if the euphony had not accidentally forbidden the simplest correction. Stanza 16, line 7. Foam fleece, followed by full stop in capital A and capital B, by a comma in G. Stanza 19, line 3. Hauling, H-A-W-L-I-N-G, thus spelt in all three. Stanza 21, line 2. G omits the. Stanza 26, lines 5 and 6. The semicolon is autographic correction in capital B. The stop at way is uncertain in capital A and capital B. Is a comma in G. Stanza 29, line 3. Night, six. Line 8. Two of the required stresses are on Tarpeian. Stanza 34. Line 8. Shire. G has sure, but Shire is doubtless right. It is a special favored landscape visited by the This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information for how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Poems by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read by Linda Liu. Part 2. Poem 5. Penman Pool. For the visitor's book at the inn. Who long for rest. Who look for pleasure away from counter, court, or school, or where live well your lease of leisure, but here at, here at Penman Pool. You'll dare the Alp, you'll dart the skiff, each sport has here its tackle and tool. Come, plant the staff by Kader Cliff. Come, swing the skulls on Penman Pool. What's yonder? Grizzled dive-wise dim, The triple hummock giant stool, Whore messmate, hobs and knobs with him, To have the bull of Penman Pool. And all the landscape under survey, at tranquil turns, by nature's rule, Rides repeated topsy-turvy in frank, in fairy penman pool. And Charles Wayne, the wondrous seven, And sheep flock clouds like worlds of wool, For all they shine so high in heaven, Show brighter, shaken in Penman Pool. The modage, how she trips, though throttled, if flood tide teeming thrills her fool, and mazy sands, all water waddled, waylay her at ebb past Penman Pool. But what's to see in stormy weather? When gray showers gather and gusts are cool, why raindrop roundels loop together that lace the face of Penman Pool? Then even in weariest wintry hour of New Year's month or surly Yule-furred snows, charged tuft above tuft. 
tower from darksome, darksome pen man pool. And ever, if bound here hardest home, you've parlor pastime left, and who'll not honor it? Ale like goldy foam that frocks an oar in pen man pool. Then come who pine for peace or pleasure, away from counter, court, or school. Spend here your measure of time and treasure, and taste the treats of pen man pool. Poem six, the Silver Jubilee, to James First Bishop of Shrewsbury, on the twenty-fifth year of his episcopate. July twenty eighth, eighteen seventy six. One, though no high hung bells or din of brackered bugles cry it in, what is sound? Nature's round makes a silver jubilee. Two, five and twenty years have run since sacred fountains to the sun sprang that but now were shot. Showering silver jubilee. Three. Feast, when we shall fall asleep. Shrewsbury may see others keep. None but you this, her true. This, her silver jubilee. Four. Not today we need lament. Your wealth of life is some way spent. Oil has shed round your head, silver but for jubilee. Five. Then for whose velvet veils should have pealed with welcome wails, let the chime of a rhyme utter silver jubilee. Poem seven. God's grandeur. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil, gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil, crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and where is man's much? And shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went, O oh morning. At the brown brink eastward springs, Because the Holy Ghost over the bent world Broods with warm breast and with, ah, bright wings. Poem 8, The Starlight Night Look at the stars, look, look up at the skies, Oh, look at all the fire folk sitting in the air, the bright boroughs, the circle citadels there, down in dim woods, the diamond dells, the elves' eyes, the gray lawns cold where gold, where quick gold lies, wind beat white beam, area bellis set on a flare. Flake doves sent floating forth at a farmyard scare. Ah, well, it is all a purchase, all is a prize. Buy then, bid then, what? Prayer, patience, aims, vows. Look, look, a May mess, like on orchard boughs. Look, March bloom. Like unmealed with yellow sallows, These are indeed the barn, Within doors house the shocks, 
This peace bright paling shuts a spouse, Christ home, Christ and his mother, and all his hallows. Poem 9 Spring Nothing is so beautiful as spring, When weeds and wheels shoot long and lovely and lush, Thrush's eggs look little low heavens, and thrush through the echoing timber does so rinse and wring the ear it strikes like lightnings to hear him sing the glassy pear tree leaves and blooms they brush the descending blue that blue is all in a rush with richness the racing lambs too have fair their fling what is all this juice and all this joy a strain of the earth's sweetness being in the beginning in Eden garden. Have, get, before at cloy, before at cloud, Christ, Lord, and sour with sinning, innocent mind and mayday and girl and boy, most, O oh maid's child, thy choice and worthy the winning. Poem 10 The Lantern Out of Doors Sometimes a lantern moves along the night That interests our eyes And who goes there, I think Where from and bound, I wonder Where, with all down darkness wide His waiting light Men go by me whom either beauty bright In mold or mind or what not else makes rare. They reign against our much thick and marsh air, Rich beams till death or distance buys them quite. Death or distance soon consumes them, wind. What most I may eye after, be in at the end I cannot, and out of sight is out of mind. Christ minds, Christ's interest, what to avow or amend there, eyes them, heart wants, care haunts, foot follows kind, their ransom. Their rescue, and first, fast, last friend. Poem 11 The Sea and the Skylark On ear and ear, two noises, too old to end, Trench, right, the tide that ramps against the shore, With a flood or a fall, Low, low, la, or all roar, Frequenting there, while moon shall wear and wend. Left hand, off land, I hear the lark ascend, His rash, fresh, rewinded, new skinned score, In crisps of curl, off wild winch whirl, And pour and pelt music, Till none's to spill nor spend. How these two shame this shallow and frail town. How ring right our sordid turbid time being pure. We, life's pride and cared for a crown, Have lost that cheer and charm of earth's past prime. Our make and making break, Our breaking down to man's last dust, Drain fast towards man's first slime. Poem 12 The Windover To Christ Our Lord I caught this morning, morning's minion, Kingdom of daylight dolphin, Dapple dawn drawn falcon, In his riding, 
of the rolling level underneath him steady air and striding high there how he rung upon the reen of a wimpling wing in his ecstasy then off off forth on swing as a skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend the hurl and gliding rebuff the big wind my heart in hiding stirred for a bird the achieve of the mastery of the thing brute beauty and valor in act oh air pride plume here buckle and the fire that breaks from thee then a billion times told lovelier more dangerous oh my chevalier no wonder of it sheer plod makes plow down sillion shine and blue bleak embers ah my dear fall gall themselves and gash gold vermilion poem thirteen pine beauty Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of coupled color as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire coal, chestnut falls, finches' wings, landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow, and plow and all trades their gear and tackle and trim all things counter original spare strange whatever is fickle freckled who knows how with swift slow sweet sour a dazzle dim he fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. Poem 14 Hurrying in Harvest Summer ends now, now barbarous in beauty. The stooks arise around, up above, what wind walks. What lovely behavior of silk sack clouds has wilder, willful wavier meal drift molded ever and melted across skies? I walk, I lift up, I lift up heart, eyes, down all that glory in the heavens to glean our Savior, and eyes, heart, what looks, what lips yet gave you a rapturous love's greeting of realer, of rounder replies? And the azurous hung hills are as world-wielding shoulder, majestic as a stallion stalwart, very violet sweet. These things these things were here and but the beholder wanting which too when they once meet the heart rears wings bold and bolder and hurls for him oh half hurls earth for him under This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information for how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Polls by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read by Linda Liu. Part 2B. Editor's Notes to Poems 5-14. through 14. Poem 5. Pen Man Pool. Early Copy in Capital A. Text 
title and punctuation from autograph in capital B, dated, quote, Barmouth, Marianus Shire, August 1876, unquote. But that autograph writes, Leisure for pleasure in first line. Skulls in stanza two, and in stanza eight, month has a capital initial. Several copies exist and vary. Stanza three, line two. Gader Idris is written as a note to giant stool. Stanza eight, line four. Several variants. Two good copies read darks and danksome, but the early copy in capital A has darks and darksome, which capital B returns to. Stanza 9, line 3, capital A has, but praise it, and two good copies, but honor it. Poem 6, The Silver Jubilee. In honor of the most reverend James, first bishop of Shrewsbury, St. Bono's Vale of Cloyd, 1876, I think. Capital A. Text and title from autograph in capital B. It was published with somebody's sermon on the same occasion. Another copy in H. Poem 7. God's Grandeur. Standard Rhythm Counterpointed Two Autographs February 23rd, 1877 and March 1877 in capital A Text is from Corrections in capital B The second version in capital A has Lightning for Shining in line 2 Explained in a letter of January 4th 83. Capital B returns to original word. Poem 8. The Starlight Night. February 24th, 77. Autograph in capital A. Quote, Standard Rhythm Opened and Counterpointed. March 77. Unquote. Capital A. Later Corrected Version. Quote, St. Bonos. February 77, unquote, in capital B. Text follows capital B. The second version in capital A was published in Miles' book, quote, Poets and Poetry of the Century, unquote. Poem 9, Spring. Standard rhythm, opening with sprung leadings. May 1877. Autograph in capital A Text from Corrections in capital B But punctuation from capital A Was published in Miles' book from Incomplete Correction of capital A Poem 10 The Lantern Standard Rhythm with one sprung leading And one line counterpointed Autograph in capital A Text Title and Accents in Lines 13 and 14 From Corrections in Capital B Where it is called, quote, Companion to Number 26, St. Bonos 77, unquote. Poem 11 Walking by the Sea Standard Rhythm in Parts Sprung and in Others Counterpointed Ryle, May 77, capital A. This version deleted in capital B, and the revision given in text, written in with new title. GMH was not pleased with this sonnet, and wrote the following explanations of it in a letter. 82, quote, rash, fresh, more. It is dreadful to explain these things in cold blood means a headlong and exciting new snatch of singing, resumption by the lark of his song, which by turns he gives over and takes up again all day long. 
And this goes on, the sonnet says, through all time, without ever losing its first freshness, being a thing both new and old. Repair means the same thing, renewal, resumption. The scheme and coil are the lark's song, which from its height gives the impression of something falling to the earth, and not vertically quite, but tricklingly or wavingly, something as a skein of silk, ribbed by having been tightly wound on a narrow card, or a notched holder, or as twine or fishing tackle unwinding from a reel, or winch, or as pearl strung on a horsehair. The laps or folds are the notes or short measures and bars of them, the same is called a score, in the musical sense of score, and this score is, quote, writ upon a liquid sky trembling to welcome it, unquote, only not horizontally. The lark in wild glee races the reel round, paying or dealing out and down the turns of the skein or coil right to the earth, floor, the ground, where it lies in a heap, as it were, or rather is all wound off onto another winch, reel, bob in her spool, in fancy's eye, by the moment the bird touches earth, and so is ready for a fresh and winding at the next flight. Crisp means almost crisped, namely with notes. Unquote. Poem 12 The Windover Falling Pionic Rhythm Sprung and Outriding Two Contemporary Autographs in Capital A Text and Dedication from Corrected Capital B Dated St. Bonos, May 30th, 1877 In a letter, June 22nd, 79 Quote I shall shortly send you an amended copy of the Windover. The amendment only touches a single line, I think, but as that is the best thing I ever wrote, I should like you to have it in its best form. Unquote. Poem 13 Pied Beauty Curdle Sonnet Sprung Pionic Rhythm St. Bonos Tremerkian Summer 77 Autograph in capital A, capital B agrees. Poem 14, Hurrahing and Harvest, Sonnet, Sprung and Outriding Rhythm. Take notice that the outriding feet are not to be confused with dactyls or peons, though sometimes a line might be scanned either way. The strong syllable in an outriding foot has always a great stress and after the outrider follows a short pause. The peon is easier and more flowing. Vale of Clued, September 1st, 1877 Autograph in capital A Text is from corrected capital B Punctuation of original capital A In a letter 78 he wrote, quote, The hurrahing sonnet was the outcome of half an hour of extreme enthusiasm as I walked home alone one day from fishing in the Owe. Unquote. Capital A also. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information for how you can volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Poems by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read by Linda Liu. Part 3. Poem 15. The Caged Skylark. The Daragale Skylark scanted in a dull cage. Man's mounting spirit in his bone house, mean house, dwells. That bird beyond the remembering his free fells. This is treachery, day laboring out life's age. 
Though aloft on turf or perch or poor low stage, Bull sing sometimes the sweetest, sweetest spells, Yet both droop deadly sometimes in their cells, Or ring their barriers in bursts of fear or rage. Not that the sweet fowl, song fowl, needs no rest. Why, hear him, hear him babble and drop down to his nest, But his own nest, wild nest, no prison. Man's spirit will be flesh-bound when found at best, But uncumbered, meadow down is not distressed, For rainbow footing it. Nor he for his bones risen. Poem sixteen, in the valley of the Owe. I remember a house where all were good to me. God knows, deserving no such thing. Comforting smell breathed at every entering, fetched fresh, as I suppose, of some sweet wood. That cordial air made those kind people a hood all over, As a bevy of eggs the mothering wing will, Or mild nights the new morsels of spring. Why, it seemed of course, seemed of right it should. Lovely the woods, waters, Meadows, combs, vales, All the air things wear That build this world of whales. Only the inmate does not correspond. God, lover of souls, Swaying considerate scales, Complete thy creature, dear, O where it fails, Being mighty a master. Being a father and fond. Poem 17 The Loss of the Eurydice Founded March 24th, 1878 1. Eurydice, it concerned thee, O Lord, Three hundred souls, O alas, on board, Some asleep, unawakened, all unwarned, eleven fathoms fallen. Two, where she foundered, one stroke felled and furled them, the hearts of oak, and flock bells off the aerial, downs four falls beat to the burial. Three, for did she pride her, freighted fully, Unbounded bales or a hoard of bullion, Precious passing measure, Lads and men her laid in treasure. Four, she had come from a cruise, Training seamen, men, Bold boys soon to be men, Must it, worst weather, Blast bowl and bloom together. Five, no Atlantic squall overwrought her, Or rearing billow of the Biscay water. Home was hard at hand, And the blow bore from land. 6. And you were a liar, O blue March day, Bright sun lanced fire in the heavenly bay. But what black Boreas wrecked her, He came equipped, deadly electric, Seven, a beetling bold bright cloud thorough England riding. There did stores not mingle, and hail ropes hustle and grind their heaven gravel. Wolf snow, worlds of it, wine there. Eight, now Kara's brook, keep goes under in gloom. Now it over vaults, appled or comb. Now near by Ventnor town it hurls, hurls a boniface down. Nine, too proud, too.
too proud what a press she bore royal in all her royals wore sharp with her shortened sail too late lost gone with the gale ten this was at fell capsize as half she had righted and hoped to rise death teeming in by her portholes raced down decks round messes of mortals eleven then a lurch forward frigate and men all hands for themselves the cry ran then but she who had housed them thither was around them bound them or wound them with her twelve marcus hare high her captain kept to her care drowned and wrapped in cheers death would follow his charge through the champ white water in a wallow thirteen all under channel to bury in a beach her cheeks right rude of feature he thought he heard say her commander and thou too and thou this way fourteen it is even seen time something server in mankind's medley a duty swerver at downright no or yes doth all drives fool for righteousness fifteen sydney fletcher bristol bread lo lie his mates now on watery bed takes to the seas and snows as sheer down the ship goes sixteen now her after draw goalies two down now he rings for breath with a death gush brown till a life belt and god's will lend him a lift from the sea swill seventeen now he shoots short up to the round air now he gasps now he gazes everywhere but his eye no cliff no coast or mark makes in the rivelling snowstorm. Eighteen. Him, after an hour of wintry waves, a schooner sights with another and saves, and he boards her in oh such joy, he has lost count what came next, poor boy. Nineteen. They say who saw one sea corpse cold, he was all of lovely manly mold, every inch a tar, the best we boast our sailors are. Twenty. Look, foot to forelock, how all things suit, he is strung by duty, is strained to beauty, and brown as dawning skinned with brine and shine and whirling wind twenty one oh his nimble finger his gnarled grip leagues leagues of seamanship slumber in these forsaken bones this sinew and will not waken twenty two he was but one thousands more Day and night I deplore my people and born, O oh nation, fast foundering, own oh generation. Twenty three, I might let bygones be our curse, a ruinous shrine, no hand or worse. Robbery's hand is busy to dress, poor hallowed shrines unvisited. Twenty four. Only the breathing temple and fleet life, this wild worth blown so sweet, these dare deaths, I, this crew, in unchrist, all rolled in ruin. Twenty five. Deeply, surely I need to deplore it, wondering why my master bore it, 
the riving off that race, so at home time was to his truth and grace. 26. That a starlight wonder of ours would say, A marvelous milk was waltzing him way, And one, but let be, let be, More, more than was will yet be. 27. Oh, well wept, mother have lost son, Wept, wife, wept, sweetheart would be one. Though grief yield them no good, Yet shed what tears sad true love should. 28. But to Christ, Lord of thunder, Crouch, lay knee by earth, low under, Holiest, loveliest, bravest, Save my hero, O hero savest. 29. And the prayer thou hearst me making have, And the awful overtaking heard, Have heard and granted grace, That day grace was wanted. 30. Not that hell knows redeeming, But for souls sunk and seeming fresh, Till doom fire burn all, Prayer shall fetch pity eternal. Poem 18 The May Magnificat May is Mary's month, and I muse at that and wonder why Her feasts follow reason, dated due to season Candlemas, Lady Day, but the Lady Month, May Why fasten that upon her, with a feasting in her honor? Is it only its being brighter than the most or must delight her? Is it opportunist and flowers find soonest? Ask of her, the mighty mother. Her reply puts this other question. What is spring, growth in everything? Flesh and fleece, fur and feather, grass and green world all together. Star-eyed, strawberry-breasted, Throstle above her nested, Cluster of bugle, blue eggs thin, Forms and warms the life within, And bird and blossom swell, In sod or sheath or shell, All things rising, all things sizing, Mary sees, Sympathizing with that world of good, Nature's motherhood, Their magnifying of each kind, With the light calls to mind, How she did in her stored, Magnify the Lord. Well, but there was more than this, Spring's universal bliss, Much, had much to say, to offering Mary May. When drop of blood and foamed apple bloom, Lights the orchard apple, And thicket and thorpe are merry, With silver surfeit cherry, And azuring over gray bell makes, Wood banks and breaks, And wash wet like lakes, And magic cuckoo call, Caps, Clears and clinches all. This ecstasy, all through mothering earth, Tells Mary her mirth, Till Christ's birth, To remember and exultation In God who was her salvation. Poem 19 Binzi Poplars Feld, 1879 my aspens dear, whose airy cages quelled, Quelled or quenched in leaves the leaping sun, All felled, felled, are all felled, 
of a fresh and following folded rank, not spared, not one that dandled a sandaled shadow that swam or sank on meadow and river and wind wandering, weed winding bank. Oh, if we but knew what we do when we delve or hew, hack and rack the growing green, since country is so tender to touch, her being so slender, that, like the sleek and seeing ball, but a prick will make no eye at all, where we, even where we mean to mend her, we end her, when we hew or dull. After comers cannot guess the beauty been, ten or twelve, only ten or twelve strokes of havoc unsell, the sweet especial scene. Rural scene, a rural scene, sweet, a special rural scene. Poem 20, Duns Grotus's Oxford Towery city and branchy between towers, Cuckoo echoing, bells warm it, Lark charm it, rook racked, river round it, the dapple-eared lily below thee, That country and town did once encounter in, Here coped and poised powers. Thou hast a base and brickish skirt there, Sours that neighbor nature thy gray beauty Is grounded best in. Graceless growth, thou hast confounded, Rural, rural-keeping folk, flocks and flowers. Yet, ah, this air I gather and I release, he lived on. These weeds and waters, these walls are what he haunted, who of all men most weighs my spirits to peace. Of realty, the rarest feigned unraveler, a not rivaled insight. Be rival Italy or Greece, who fired France for Mary without spot. Poem 21 Henry Purcell The poet wishes well to the divine genius of Purcell, and praises him that, whereas other musicians have given utterance to the moods of man's mind, he has, beyond that, uttered in notes the very make and species of man, as created both in him and in all men generally. Have fair fallen, O oh fair, fair have fallen, so dear to me, so arc a special, a spirit as heaves in Henry Purcell. An age is now since past, since parted, with a reversal of the outward sentence, low lays in him, listed to a heresy here. Not mood in him, nor meaning, proud fire, or sacred fear, or love, or pity, or all that sweet notes, not as might nurse. It is a forged feature, finds me. It is a rehearsal of own, of abrupt self, there so thrusts on, so throngs the ear. Let him, oh, with his air of angels, then lift me, lay me. Only I'll have an eye to the sakes of him, quaint moon marks to his pelted plumage under wings, so some great storm fowl, whenever he has walked his while, the thunder purple, sea beach plumed, purple of thunder. If a weathering of his palmy snow pinions Scatter a colossal smile off him, But meaning motion fans fresh our wits with wonder. Poem 22 Peace When will you ever peace? Wild wood dove, 
shy wings shut, you round me roaming end, and under be my bows. When, when peace will you peace? I'll not play hypocrite to my own heart. I yield you do come sometimes, but that piecemeal peace is poor peace. What pure peace allows? Alarms of wars, the daunting wars, the death of it. Oh, surely, reaving peace, my lord should leave in lieu some good. And so he does leave patience exquisite that blooms to peace thereafter. And when peace here does house, he comes with work to do. He does not come to coo. He comes to brood and sit. Poem 23, The Bugler's First Communion Bugler boy from Barak, it is over the hill there. Boy bugler, born, he tells me, of Irish mother to an English sire. He shares their best gifts, surely, of all how things will. This very, very day came down to us. After a boon he yawned, my late being there begged of me. Overflowing boon in my bestowing, came, I say, this day to it, to a first communion. Here he knelt then in regimental red, forth Christ from cupboard fetched. How fain I feet! To his youngster take his treat, Low latched and leaf light housel, His too huge godhead. There, and your sweetest sendings, Ah, divine, By it heavens befall him, As a heart, Christ darling, Dauntless, tongue true, Bought and tauntless, Breathing bloom of a chastity In man's sex fine. Frowning and forefending angel warder, Squander the hell rook ranks, Sally to molest him. March, kind comrade, abreast him, Dress his days to a dexterous and starlight order. How it does my heart good, Visiting at that bleak hill, When limber liquid youth, That to all I teach, Yields tender as a pushed peach. He's headstrong to its well-being Of a self-wise self-will. Then, though, I should tread tufts of consolation, Days after, so I in a sort deserve to, And do serve God to serve to, Just such slips of soldiery, Christ's royal ration. Nothing else is like it, no, Not all so strains us, Fresh youth fretted in a bloom fall, All portending that sweet's sweeter ending. Realm both Christ is heir to, And there reigns. Oh, now well work that sealing sacred ointment, Over now charms, arms, What bands off bad, And locks love ever in a lad. Let me, though, See no more of him, and not disappointment, Though sweet hopes quell whose least me quickenings lift, In scarlet or somewhere of some day seeing That brow and bead of being, And our day's God's own Galahad, Though this child's drift seems by divine doom channeled, Nor do I cry disaster there, but may ye not wrangle and roam In back wheels, though bound home, That left to the Lord of the Eucharist I here lie by. Recorded only, I have put my lips on pleas, Would brandle adamantine heaven, With ride and jar, did prayer go disregarded, Forward-like, but however, and like favorable heaven heard these. Poem 24 Morning, Midday, and Evening Sacrifice The dappled die away, cheek and wimpled lip, 
the gold wisp, the airy gray eye, all in fellowship. This, all this beauty blooming, this, all this freshness fuming, give God while worth consuming, both thought and though now bolder, and told by nature, tower, head, heart, hand, heel, and shoulder, that beat and breathe in power, this pride of prime's enjoyment, take as for tool, not toy, meant, and hold at Christ's employment, vault and scope and schooling, and mastery in the mind, in silk ash kept from cooling, and ripest under rind, what life half lifts the latch of, what hell stalks towards the snatch of, your offering with dispatch of. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information for how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Poems by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read by Linda Liu. Part 3B. Editor's Notes to Poems 15 through 24. Poem 15. The Game Skylark. Following Pionic Rhythm. Sprung and outriding, autograph in capital A, text from corrected capital B, which dates St. Buenos, 1877. In line 13, capital B writes, Uncumbered, U accented, N C U accented, M B E R E accented d poem sixteen in the valley of the owe standard rhythm sprung and counterpointed autograph in capital a text is from corrected capital b which dates as contemporary with poem fifteen adding quote, for the companion to this see number thirty five unquote Poem 17, The Loss of the Eurydice. A contemporary copy in capital A has this note, quote, Written in sprung rhythm, the third line has three beats, the rest four. The scanning runs on without break to the end of the stanza, so that each stanza is rather one long line, rhymed in passage, than four lines with rhymes at the ends, unquote. Capital B has an autograph of the poem as it came to be corrected. Open parentheses, 83 or after. Close parentheses. Without the above note, and dated, quote, Mount St. Mary, Derbyshire, April 78, unquote. Text follows capital B. The injurious rhymes are partly explained in the old note. Stanza 9. Shortened sail. Seamanship at fault. But this expression may be glossed by supposing the boat swain to have sounded that call on his whistle. Stanza 12. Cheers death, i.e. despair. Stanza 14. It is even seen. In a letter May 30th, 78, he explains, quote, you mistake the sense of this as I feared it should be mistaken. I believed Hare to be a brave and conscientious man. What I say is that even those who seem unconscientious will act the right part at a great push. About mort holes, I wince a little. Unquote. Stanza 26 a starlight wonder, i.e., the island was so Marian that the folk supposed the Milky Way was a finger-post, 
to guide pilgrims to the shrine of the Virgin at Walsingham. And one, that is, Don Scrotus, the champion of the Immaculate Conception, see Sonnet number 20, stands a 27, well wept. Grammar is as in, quote, well hit, well run, unquote, etc. The meaning, quote, you do well to weep, unquote. Stanza 28, O hero savest, omission of relative pronoun at its worst, equals, O hero that savest. The prayer is in a mourner's mouth, who prays that Christ will have saved her hero. And in stanza 29, the grammar triumphs. Poem 18, May Magnificat. Sprung rhythm, four stresses in each line of the first couplet, three in each of the second. Stonyhurst, May 78, autograph in capital A. Text from later autograph in capital B. He wrote to me, quote, A May piece in which I see little good but the freedom of the rhythm. Unquote. In penult stanza, Kaku call has its hyphen deleted in capital B, leaving the words separate. Poem 19, Binzi Poplars, Feld, 1879. Oxford, March, 1879. Autograph in capital A, text from capital B, which alters four places. Line 8, Weed Winding, an early draft, has weed wound in. Poem 20, Don Scrotus is Oxford. Oxford, March, 1879. Autograph in capital A. Copy in capital B agrees, but dates 1878. Poem 21. Henry Purcell. Alexandrin. Six dresses to the line. Oxford, April 1879. Autograph in capital A. With argument as printed. Copy in capital B is uncorrected except that it adds the word fresh in last line. Quote, have fair fallen, unquote. Have is a singular imperative, or optative, if you like, of the past, a thing possible and actual, both in logic and grammar, but naturally a rare one, as in the second person we say, Quote, have done, unquote, or in making appointments, quote, have had your dinner beforehand, unquote. So one can say in the third person, not only, quote, fair fall, unquote, of what is present or future, but also, quote, have fair fallen, unquote, of what is past. The same thought, which plays a great part in my own mind and action, is more clearly expressed in the last stanza, but one of the Eurydice, where you remarked it. Unquote. Letter to R. B., February 3rd, 83. Quote, the sestet of the Purcell sonnet is not so clearly worked out as I could wish. The thought is that as a seabird opening his wings with a whiff of wind in your face means a whir of the motion, but also unaware gives you a whiff of knowledge about his plumage, the marking of which stamps his species that he does not mean, so Purcell, seemingly intent only on the thought or feeling he is to express or call out incidentally lets you remark the individualizing marks of his own genius. Quote, Sake is a word I find it convenient to use. It is the sake of, quote, for the sake of, unquote, for sake, 
namesake, keepsake. I mean by it, the being a thing has outside itself, as a voice by its echo, a face by its reflection, a body by its shadow, a man by his name, fame, or memory, and also that in the thing by virtue of which especially it has as being abroad, and that is something distinctive, marked, specifically or individually speaking, as for a voice and echo clearness, for a reflected image, light, brightness, for a shadow-casting body bulk, for a man genius, great achievements, amiability, and so on. In this case it is, as the sonnet says, distinctive quality and genius. By moon marks, I mean crescent-shaped markings on the quill feathers, either in the coloring of the feather, or made by the overlapping of one on another. Unquote. Letter to R. B. May 26, 79. Poem 22. Peace, Oxford, 1879. Autograph in capital B, where a comma after daunting is due to follow a deletion. To own my heart equals to my own heart. Reaving peace, i.e., when he reaves or takes peace away. As poem 35, line 12. An early draft dated October 2nd, 79, has Taking for Reaving. Poem 23, The Bugler's First Communion. Sprung Rhythm, Over Rove, An Outride Between the Third and Fourth Foot of the Fourth Line in Each Stanza. Oxford, July 27th, Question Mark, 1879. Capital A. My copy of this in capital B shows three emendations. First draft exists in H. Text is capital A with the corrections from capital B. At nine lines from end, though this, capital A has now this, and now is deliberately preferred in H. Capital B has some uncorrected miscopyings of capital A. O for now charms of capital A is already a correction in H. I should like a comment and a first line of this stanza and an interjection mark at end of that stanza. Poem 24 Morning, Midday, and Evening Sacrifice Oxford, August 79 Autograph in capital A The first stanza reproduced after page 70 Copied by me into capital B Where it received correction Text follows capital B Except in lines 19 and 20 Where the correction reads What death half lifts the latch of What hell hopes soon the snatch of and punctuation is not all followed. Original has come after the second, this, in lines five and six. On June thirtieth, eighty six, GMH wrote to Canon Dixon, who wished to print the first stanza alone in some anthology, and made ad hoc alterations, which I do not follow. The original seventeenth line was, silk ashed but core not cooling and was altered because of its obscurity quote, i meant he wrote to compare gray hairs to the flakes of silky ash which may be seen round wood embers and covering a core of heat unquote. your offering with dispatch of is said like quote, your ticket Unquote. Quote, your reasons, unquote. Quote, your money or your life, unquote. It is, quote, come, your offer of all this, 
the matured mind. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or for how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Poems by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read by Linda Liu. Part 4. Poem 25. Andromeda. Now at times Andromeda on this rock rude with not her either beauty's equal or her injuries, looks off by both horns ashore. Her flower, her piece of being, doomed dragon's food. Time past she has been attempted and pursued by many blows and banes, but now here is roar, a wilder beast from west than all were. More rife in her wrongs, more lawless, and more lewd. Her Perseus linger, and leave her to her extremes. Pillowy air he treads at time, and hangs his thoughts on her, forsaken that she seems, all while her patience, morseled into pangs, mounts. Then to a light disarming, no one dreams, with gorgon's gear and bare bill, thongs and fangs. Poem 26 The Candle Indoors Some candle clear burns somewhere I come by. I muse at how its being puts blissful back with yellowy moisture, mild nights, Clear all black, or two fro tender tram beams truckle at the eye. By that window, what task, what fingers ply? I plod wondering, a wanting, just for lack of answer, the eager, a wanting, Jesse or Jack, their God and Grandi. God to glorify. Come you indoors, come home, your fading fire mend first, and vital candle in close heart's vault. You there are master, do your own desire. What hinders? Are you being blind, yet to a fault? in the neighbor, death-handed. Are you that liar, and, cast by conscience out, spend savor salt? Poem 27 The Handsome Heart and a Gracious Answer But tell me, child, your choice. What shall I buy you? Father, what you buy me I like best. With the sweetest air that said, Still plied and pressed, He swung to his first poised purport of reply. What the heart is, Which like carriers let fly, Doff darkness, Homing nature knows the rest, To its own fine function, Wild and self and stress. Paul's light is ten years long, taught how to and why. Mannerly hearted, more than handsome face, beauty's bearing or muse of mounting vain, all in this case, bathed in the high hallowing grace. Of heaven what boon to buy you, boy, or gain not granted, only... Oh, on that path you pace, run all your race, O oh, brace sterner that strain. Poem 28 At the Wedding March God with honor hang your head, Groom and grace you, bride, your bed. 
Willisome scions, sweet scions, Out of hallowed bodies bred, Each be other's comfort kind, Deep, deeper than divine. Divine charity, dear charity, Fast you ever, fast bind. Then let the march tread our ears. I to him turn with tears. Who to wedlock his wonder wedlock deals trial in immortal years. Poem 29 Felix Randall Felix Randall the farrier Oh, he is dead then. My duty all ended. Who have watched his mold of man, Big boned and hardy handsome, Pining, pining, Till time when reason rambled in it, And some fatal four disorders, Flesh there, all contended. Sickness broke him, Impatient at first, But mended, being anointed and all. Though a heavenlier heart began Some months earlier, Since I had our sweet reprieve and ransom Tendered to him. Ah, oh, well, God rest him all road Ever he offended, This seeing the sick endears him to us, Us too it endears. My tongue had taught thee comfort, Touch had quenched thy tears, Thy tears that touched my heart, child, Felix, poor Felix Randall. How far from then forethought of All thy more boisterous years, When thou at the random grim forge, Powerful amidst peers, Didst fettle for the great gray dray horse, His bright and battering sandal. Poem 30 Brothers how lovely the elder brother's life All laced in the others. Love laced, what once I well witnessed, So fortune fell. When Shrove tie two years gone, Our boys' plays brought on, Part was picked for John, young John. Then fear, then joy, Ran revel in the elder boy, Their night was come now. All our company thronged the hall. Henry, by the wall, beckoned me beside him. I came where called, and eyed him by meanwhiles, Making my play turn most on tender by play. For rung all on love's rack, My lad, and lost in jack, Smiled, blushed, and bit his lip, Or drove with a diver's dip, Clutched hands down through clasped knees. Truce tokens, tricks like these. Old tell-tales with what stress He hung on the imp's success. Now the other was brass bold. He had no work to hold. His heart up at the strain. Nay, roguish ran the vein. Two tedious acts were passed. Jack's call and cue at last, When Henry, heart forsook, Dropped eyes and dared not look. Eh, how all wrung! Young dog, he did give tongue, But Harry, in his hands he has flung, His tear-tricked cheeks aflame, For fond love and for shame. Ah, nature, framed in fault, There's comfort then, there's song. Nature, bad, base, and blind, Dearly thou canst be kind. There, dearly then, dearly, I'll cry thou canst be kind. Poem 31 Spring and Fall To a Young Child Margaret, are you grieving Over golden grove unleaving? Leaves like the things of man, you with your fresh thoughts care for, can you? Ah, as a heart grows older, Will come to such sights colder by and by, Nor spare a sigh, 
Though worlds of wain wood leave me a lie, And yet you will weep and know why. Now no matter, child, the name, Sorrow's springs are the same. Nor mouth had, no, nor mind, Expressed what heart heard of, Ghost guessed. It is a blight man was born for, It is Margaret you mourn for. Poem 32 Spelt from Sibyl's Leaves Earnest, earthless, equal, attunable, vaulty, voluminous, stupendous, evening strains to be times vast, womb of all, home of all, hearse of all night. Her fawn yellow horn light, wound to the west, her wild hollow hoar light hung to the height waste her earliest stars earl stars stars principal overbend us fire featuring heaven for earth her being has unbound her dapple is at an end a stray or a swarm all throught her in throngs, Self in self steeded and pashed, Quite disremembering, dismembering, All now, heart, you round me right with, Our evening is over us, Our night whelms, whelms, And will end us. Only the beak-leaved bows dragonish to musk, The tool-smooth bleak light, Black, ever so black on it. Our tale, O oh, our oracle, Let life waned, Ah, let life wind, Off her, once schemed, Stained, veined, variety upon, all on two spools, part, pen, pack. Now her all in two flocks, two folds, black, white, right, wrong, rack and butt, rack, butt, mind. But these two, where of a world where but these two tell, each off the other, of a rack where self-wrung, self-strung, sheath and shelterless, thoughts against thoughts and groans grind. Poem 33, in verse 8 This darksome burn, horseback brown, Is roll rock, high road, roaring down, in coop and in comb the fleece of his foam flutes and low to the lake falls home a wind puff bonnet of fawn froth turns and dwindles over the broth of a pool so pitch black fell frowning it rounds and rounds despair to drowning Dagged with dew, dappled with dew, Are the groins of the braise That the brook treads through. Wiry heath packs, flitches of fern, And the bead bonny ash That sits over the burn. What would the world be, once bereft, Of wet and of wildness? Let them be left, oh, let them be left, Wildness and wet Long live the weeds And the wilderness yet Poem 34 As kingfishers catch fire Dragonflies draw flame As kingfishers catch fire Dragonflies draw flame As tumbled over rim In roundy wells Stones ring like each tucked string tells, Each hung bell's bow swung, 
vine's tongue to fling out broad its name. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same, deals out that being indoors each one dwells, sells, goes itself, myself it speaks and spells, crying, what I do is me, for that I came. I say more, the just man justices, keeps grace, that keeps all his goings graces, acts in God's eye what in God's eye he is, Christ, for Christ plays in ten thousand places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes not his, to the Father through the This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information for how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Polls by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read by Linda Liu. Part 4B. Editor's Notes to Poems 25 through 34. Poem 25. Andromeda. Oxford, August 12th, 79. Capital A, which capital B corrects in two places only. Text rejects the first in line four. Dragon, four. Dragon, apostrophe S. But follows B in line ten, where capital A had air, pillowy air. There is no comma at bearabil in any manuscript but a gap and sort of cesseral mark in capital A. In a letter August 14, 79, GMH writes, quote, I enclose a sonnet on which I invite minute criticism. I endeavored in it at a more Miltonic plainness and severity than I have anywhere else. I cannot say it has turned out severe, still less plain, but it seems almost free from quaintness and in aiming at one excellence, I may have hit another. Unquote. Poem 26, The Candle Indoors Common Rhythm, Counterpointed, Oxford 79 Capital A, Text Takes Correction of Capital B, which adds, quote, Companion to Number 10, Unquote. Capital A has in line 2, with a yellowy, and five, at that. Poem 27, The Handsome Heart, Common Rhythm Counterpointed, Oxford 79, Capital A, 1. In August of the same year, he wrote that he was surprised at my liking it, and in deference to my criticism sent a revise. Capital A, 2. Subsequently he recasts a sonnet, mostly in the longer six dress lines, and wrote that into capital B. In that final version, the charm and freshness have disappeared, and his emendation in evading the clash of ply and reply is awkward. Also, the fourteen lines now contain seven what's. I have therefore taken capital A1 for the text, and have ventured in line 8 to restore how to in the place of what from the original version which exists in H in quote, the spirit of man unquote, I gave a mixture of capital A1 and capital A2 in line 5 the word soul is in H and A1 but A2 and B have heart. Father, in second line, was a reverend father, Gerard himself. He tells the whole story in a letter to me. Poem 28, At a Wedding, Sprung Rhythm, Bedford, Lancashire, October 21st, 79, Capital A, 
autograph uncorrected in capital B, but title changed to that in text. Poem 29, Felix Randall, Sonnet, Sprung in Outriding Rhythm, Six Foot Lines, Liverpool, April 28th, 80, Capital A, Text from Capital A with the two corrections of Capital B, the comma in line 5 after Impatient is omitted in copy in capital B. Poem 30, Brothers, Sprung Rhythm, Three Feet to the Line, Lines Free-Ended and Not Overrove, and Reversed or Counterpointed Rhythm Allowed in the First Foot. Hampstead, August, 1880. Five various drafts exist. Capital A-1 and Capital A-2, both of August 80. Capital B was copied by me from Capital A-1, and author's emendations of it overlook those in Capital A-2. Text, therefore, is from Capital A-2, except that the first seven lines, being rewritten in margin afresh, and confirmed in letter of April 81 to Canon Dixon, as also corrections in lines 15 through 18, these are taken. But the capital B corrections of lines 22, 23, almost certainly implies forgetfulness of capital A too. In last line, capital B has correction. Dearly thou canst be kind, but the intention of all cry was original, and has four manuscripts in its favor. Poem 31, Spring and Fall, Sprung Rhythm, Lydiate, Lancashire, September 7th, 1880, Capital A, Text and Title from Capital B, which corrects four lines, and misstates 81. There is also a copy in D, January 81, and C again, April 6, 81. In line 2, the last word is unleafing in most of the manuscripts. An attempt to amend the second rhyme was unsuccessful. Poem 32, Spalt from Sybil's Leaves, Sonnet, Sprung Rhythm, Arrest of One Stress in the First Line, Autograph in Capital A, Another Later in Capital B, which is taken for text, Date Unrecorded, Lines 5, 6, Astray, Thus Divided to Show the Rhyme, 6. Thruther, an adjective, now confined to dialect. It is a speech form of through, other, in which shape it eludes pursuit in the Oxford Dictionary. Dr. Murray compares German, durch einander. Mr. Craigie tells me that the classical quotation for it is from Burns's, quote, Halloween, unquote. Stanza five. They roar and cry a thruther. Line eight. With, i.e., I suppose, with your warning that, etc., the heart is speaking. Line nine. Beak leaved is not hyphened in manuscript. Line eleven. Part, pen, pack imperatives of the verbs in the sense of sorting quote, the sheep from the goats unquote. line 12 capital A has wrong right but the correction to right wrong in capital B is intentional line 14 sheath in both manuscripts but I can only make sense of sheath i.e., quote, sheathless and shelterless. The accents in this poem are a selection from capital A and capital B. Poem 33, Inverse Nade, September 28, 1881, Autograph in H. I have found no other trace of this poem. Poem 34, As Kingfishers, Text from undated autograph in H. 
a draft with corrections and variants. In lines three and four, hung and to fling out broad are corrections in same later penciling as line five, which occurs only thus with them. In sestet, the first three lines of alternatives of regular rhythm, thus. Then I say more, the just man justices, keeps grace, and that keeps all his goings graces, in God's eye, acts, etc. Of these lines, in 9 and 10, the version given in text is later than the regular lines just quoted, and probably preferred. In stanza 1, line 11, This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information for how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Poems by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read by Linda Liu. Part 5. Poem 35. Ribblesdale. Earth, sweet earth, sweet landscape would leave us throng and louch at low grass, heaven that dost appeal to, with no tongue to plead, no heart to feel, that canst but only be, but dost that long, thou canst but be, but that thou well dost, strong thy plea with him who dealt, nay, does now deal, thy lovely dale down thus, and thus bids reel thy river, and o'er gives all to rack or wrong. And what is earth's eye, tongue, or heart else? Where else but in dear and dog man? Ah, the heir to his own self bent, so bound, so tied to his turn, to thriftless reeve, both are rich round, world bare, and none wreck a world after. This bids where? Earth brows of such care, care and dear concern. Poem 36 The Leaden Echo and the Golden Echo Maiden Song from St. Winifred's Well The Leaden Echo How to keep? Is there any, any? Is there none such, nowhere known some? Bow or brooch or braid or brace, lace, latch or catch or key to keep back beauty, keep it, beauty, 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 from vanishing away. Oh, is there no frowning of these wrinkles, ranked wrinkles deep down? No waving off of these most mournful messengers, Still messengers, Sad and stealing messengers of grey. No, there's none, there's none, Oh no, there's none. Nor can you long be what you now are, Called fair. Do what you may do, what? Do what you may, and wisdom is early to despair. Be beginning, since, no, nothing can be done to keep at bay age and age's evils, hoar hair, rock and wrinkle, drooping, dying, death's worst, winding sheets. Tombs and worms and tumbling to decay. So be beginning, be beginning to despair. Oh, there's none. No, 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 there's none. Be beginning to despair, to despair, 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 
despair, despair. A golden echo. Spare. There is one. Yes, I have one. Hush there. Only not within seeing of the sun. Not within the singeing of the strong sun. Tall suns tinging. But treacherous the tainting of the earth's air. Somewhere elsewhere there is a ah, well where one one yes I can tell such a key I do know such a place where whatever is prized and passes of us everything that's fresh and fast flying of us seems to us sweet of us and swiftly away with done away with undone undone done with soon done with and yet dearly and dangerously sweet of us the wimpled water dimpled not by morning matched face the flower of beauty fleece of beauty too too apt to ah to fleet never fleets more fastened with the tenderest truth to its own best being and its loveliness of youth it is an everlastingness of oh it is an all youth come then your ways and airs and looks locks made in gear Gallantry and gaiety and grace, winning ways, airs innocent, maiden manners, sweet looks, loose locks, long locks, love locks, gay gear, going gallant, girl grace, resign them, sign them, seal them. Send them, motion them with breath, and with sighs soaring, soaring sighs, deliver them. Beauty and the ghost, deliver it, early now, long before death. Give beauty back, beauty, 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 back to God, beauty's self and beauty's giver. See, not a hair is, not an eyelash, not the least lash lost. Every hair is, hair of the head, numbered. Nay, what we had light-handed left and surely the mere mold will have waked and have waxed and have walked with the wind what while we slept this side that side hurling a heavy headed hundredfold what while we while we slumbered oh then weary then why when the thing we freely forfeit is kept with fonder a care fonder a care kept then we could have kept it, kept far with fonder a care, and we, we should have lost it, finer, fonder a care kept, where kept, do but tell us where kept, where, yonder, what high is that, we follow, now we follow, Yonder, yes, yonder, yonder, yonder. Poem 37 The Blessed Virgin Compared to the Air We Breathe Wild air, world-mothering air, Nestling me everywhere, That each eyelash or hair girdles, Goes home betwixt the fleeciest, Frailest, flixed snowflake, 
that's fairly mixed with riddles and is rife in every least thing's life. This needful, never spent, and nursing element, my more than meat and drink, my meal at every wink, this air which by life's law my lung must draw and draw, now but to breathe its praise, minds me in many ways, of her who not only gave God's infinity, dwindled to infancy, welcome in womb and breast, birth, milk, and all the rest, but mothers each new grace, that does now reach our race. Mary Immaculate, merely a woman, yet whose presence power is great as no goddesses was deemed, dream it, who this one work has to do, let all God's glory through, God's glory which would go through her and from her flow off, and no way but so. I say that we are wound with mercy round and round, as if with air, the same as Mary, more by name. She, wild web, wondrous robe, mantles a guilty globe, since God has let dispense her prayers, his providence, nay, more than almoner, the sweet alms of self is her, and men are meant to share her life as life does air. If I have understood, she holds high motherhood towards all our ghostly good and plays in grace her part about man's beating heart, laying like air's fine flood the death dance in his blood. Yet no part but what will be Christ our Savior still of her flesh he took flesh, he does take fresh and fresh, though much the mystery how, not flesh but spirit now, and makes, O oh marvelous, new Nazareth in us, where she shall yet conceive him, morning, noon, and eve, new Bethlehem's, and he born there, evening, noon, and morn, Bethlehem or Nazareth. Men here may draw like breath more Christ than baffle death, who, born so, comes to be new self and nobler me, and each one and each one more makes when all is done, both God's and Mary's son. Again look overhead, how air is a surret, oh how, nay, do but stand, where you can lift your hand skywards, rich, rich it laps round the forefinger caps, yet such a sapphire shot, charged, steep its sky will not stain light, yea, mark you this, it does no prejudice, the glass blue days are those when every color glows, each shape and shadow shows. Blue be it, this blue heaven, the seven or seven times seven hued sunbeam, will transmit perfect, not alter it. Or if there does some soft, on things aloof, aloft, bloom breathe, that one breath more earth is a fair for. Whereas did e'er not make this bath of blue and slake his fire, the sun would shake, a blear and blinding ball with blackness bound, and all the thick stars round him roll, flashing like flecks of coal, quartz fret, or sparks of salt, in grimy, vasty bald. So God was God of old. Mother came to mold those limbs like ours which are what must make our day star much dearer to mankind, whose glory bare would blind 
or less would win man's mind. Through her we may see him made sweeter, not made dim, and her hand leaves his light sifted to suit our sight. Be thou then, O thou dear mother, my atmosphere, my happier world wherein to wend and meet no sin. Above me, round me lie, fronting my forward eye, with sweet and scarless sky. Stir in my ears, speak there of God's love, O live air of patience, penance, prayer, world mothering air, air wild, wound with thee, in thee isled, fold home, fast fold thy child. Poem 38 To What Serves Mortal Beauty To what serves mortal beauty, dangerous, does at dancing blood, the O seal that so feature, flung prouder form than Purcell tune, let's tread to. See, it does this, keeps warm men's wits to the things that are. What good means, where a glance master more may then gaze, gaze out of countenance, those lovely lands once, wet fresh. Wind falls a war storm. How then should Gregory, a father, have gleaned else from swarmed Rome? But God to a nation dealt that day's dear chance. To man that needs would worship block or barren stone. Our law says, love what our love's worthiest were all known world's loveliest, men's selves. Self flashes off frame and face. What do, then, how meet beauty, merely meet it, own, home at heart, heaven's sweet gift, then leave, let that alone. Yea, wish that thou, wish all, God's better beauty, Grace. Poem 39 A Soldier Yes, why do we all, seeing of a soldier, bless him? Bless our red coats, our tars, both these being the greater part, the frail clay, nay, the foul clay. Here it is, the heart, since Proud it calls the calling manly, Gives a guess that, hopes that, Makes believe the men must be no less. It fancies, fiends, deems, Dears the artist after his art, And vain will find as sterling All as all is smart. And scarlet wear the spirit of war there express. Mark Christ our King, he knows war, served the soldiering through. He of all can handle a rope best. There he bides in bliss now, and seeing somewhere some man do all that man can do. For love he leans forth, needs his neck must fall on, kiss and cry, O Christ done deed, so God made flesh does too. Where I come o'er again, cries Christ, This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information for how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Poems by Gerard Manley Hopkins, read by Linda Liu. Part Five B, Editor's Notes to Poems, Thirty-Five through Thirty-Nine. Poem Thirty-Five, Rimblesdale, Stonyhurst, eighteen eighty-two. Autograph in capital A. Text from later autograph in capital B, which adds, quote, "Companion to Number Ten." Unquote. Open parentheses equals sixteen. Close parentheses. There is a third autograph in D, June eighty three, with different punctuation, which gives a comma between two and with in line three. The dash after man is from. Capital A and D, both of which quote "nam expectatio crasturai," unquote, etc. From Romans, chapter eight, verse nineteen. In the letter to R. W. D., he writes, quote, "Louched is a coinage of mine, and is to mean much the same as slouched." slouching, and I mean throng for an adjective as we use it in Lancashire, unquote. But Louch has ample authority. See the, quote, English Dialect Dictionary, unquote. Poem 36, The Leaden Echo and the Golden Echo, Stonyhurst, October 13th, 82. Autograph in capital A. Copy of this with autograph corrections dated Hampstead, 81, sec, in capital B. Text takes all capital B's corrections, but respects punctuation of capital A, except that I have added the comma after God in last line of page 56. For the drama of Winifred, see among posthumous fragments. Number 58. In November 1882, he wrote to me, quote, I'm somewhat dismayed about that piece, and I've laid it aside for a while. I cannot satisfy myself about the first line. You must know that words like charm and enchantment will not do. The thought is of beauty as of something that can be physically kept and lost, and by physical things only, like keys. Then the things must come from the mundus muliembris, and thirdly, they must not be markedly old-fashioned. You will see that this limits the choice of words very much indeed. However, I shall make some changes. Back is not pretty, but it gives that feeling of physical constraint which I want. Unquote. And in October eighty-six to R. W. D. Quote, never did anything more musical." Unquote. Poem 37 Mary, Mother of Divine Grace, Compared to the Air We Breathe Stonyhurst, May 83 Autograph in capital A Text entitled from later autograph in capital B Taken by Dean Beeching into quote, A Book of Christmas Verse unquote, 1895 and thence, incorrectly, by Orby Shipley in, quote, Carmina Mariana, unquote, stated in the letter to R. W. D., June 25th, 83, to have been written to, quote, hang up among the verse compositions in the tongues. I did a piece in the same meter as blue in the mist all day. Unquote. Note Chaucer's account of the physical properties of the air. Quote, House of Fame. Unquote. Book 2, line 256. Sequence. Poem 38. To what serves mortal beauty? Common rhythm highly stressed. Sonnet. August 23rd, 85. Autograph in capital A. Another autograph in capital B with a few variants from which capital A was chosen. 
the deletion of alternatives incomplete. Thirdly, a copy sent to RWD, apparently later than capital A, but with errors of copy. The text given is guided by this version in D, and needs in line 9 is substituted there for the wants in capital A and capital B, probably because of once in line 6. Original drafts exist in H on same page with 39 and 40. The following is a signature at the state. Picture in handwriting. Your affectionate illegible word Gerard M. Hopkins May 29th 1885 Poem 39 Soldier Klongauer August 1885 Autograph in H with a few corrections which I have taken for lines 6 and 7 of which the first draft runs It fancies, it deems dears the artist after his art so fiends it finds as etc. The manuscript marks a Cicero place in ten of the lines. In line two, between both and these, stanza one, line three, at the full stop, stanza one, line six, fancies, fiends, deems, take three stresses, stanza one, line eleven, after man. In line seven I have added a comma at smart. In stanza one, line ten, I have substituted handle for reeve of manuscript. See note on reeve in editor's notes and author's preface. And in stanza one, line thirteen, have hyphened God made flesh. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information for how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Poems by Gerard Manley Hopkins Read by Linda Liu Part 6 Poem 40 Carrying Comfort Not, I'll not carry in comfort, despair, not feast on thee, not untwixt, slack they may be, these last strands of man in me, or most weary, cry I can no more, I can, can something, hope, wish day come, not choose not to be, but ah, but oh thou terrible, why wouldst thou rude on me, thy ring world, right foot rock, lay a lion limb against me, scan with darksome devouring eyes my bruised bones, and fan owen oh, turns of tempest, me heaped there, me frantic to avoid thee and flee. Why? That my shaft might fly, my grain lie, sheer and clear. Nay, in all that toil, that coil, since, seems, I kiss the rod, hand rather. My heart, low, lapped strength, stole joy, with laugh, cheer. Cheer whom, though? The hero whose heaven-handling flung me, foot trod me, or me that fought him. Oh, which one? Is it each one? That night, that year of now done darkness, I wretch lay wrestling with my God, my God.
Poem 41 No worst there is none Pitched past pitch of grief No worst there is none Pitched past pitch of grief More pangs will Schooled at four pangs Wilder ring Comforter Where Where is your comforting Mary, mother of us, where is your relief? My cries heave, herds long, huddle in a main, a chief woe, world sorrow, on an age-old anvil, wince and sing, then lull, then leave off. Beery had shrieked, no lingering, let me be fell, force I must be brief. Oh, the mind, mind has mountains, cliffs of fall, frightful, sheer, no man fathomed. Hold them cheap, may who ne'er hung there, nor does long our small durance deal with that steep. Or deep here creep wretch under a comfort serves in a whirlwind all life death does end and each day dies with sleep poem forty two tom's garland upon the unemployed tom garlanded with squat and surly steel Tom, then Tom's fellow boot fellow, piles pick by him, and rips out rock fire home forth, sturdy dick. Tom hard at ease, Tom navy, he is all for his meal, sure, sped now, low be it, lustily his low lot, feel that ne'er need hunger, Tom, Tom seldom sick. Seldom are heart sore That treads through pick-proof Thick thousands of thorns Thoughts swings through Common wheel Little I wreck ho Lack level in If all had bread What? Country is honor enough In all of us Lordly head With heaven slides High hung round or mother ground that mammocks mighty foot but no way sped nor mind nor main strength gold go garlanded with perilous oh no nor yet plot safe shot sound undenizened beyond bound of earth's glory earth's ease all no one Nowhere, and why the world's wheel, rare gold, bold steel, bear in both, care, but share care, this by despair, bread hang dog dole, by rage man wolf, worse, and their packs infest the age. Poem forty three. Harry Plowman, hard as hurdle arms, with a broth of goldish flu breathed round, the rack of ribs, the scooped flank, lank rope over thigh, knee nave, and barrel shank, head and foot, shoulder and shank, by a gray eye's heat steered well. One crew, fall to, stand at stress, each limb's barrowy brawn, his though that one were curded, one were socked or sank, sword or sank, though as a beech bowl firm finds his, as at a roll call, rank and features in flesh. What deed he each must do, 
His sinew service where do He leans to it Harry bends Look Back Elbow and liquid waste in him All quail to the wallowing of the plows Cheek crimsons Curls wag across bridle In a wind lifted Wind laced See his wind lily locks laced Churl's grace too Child of almond strength How it hangs or hurls them Broad and bluff Hide his frowning feet lashed Raced with Along with Craig iron under And cold furls With a fountain's shining shot furls Poem 44 to seem the stranger lies my lot, my life. To seem the stranger lies my lot, my life among strangers, father and mother dear. Brothers and sisters are in Christ not near, and he my peace, my parting, sword and strife. England, whose honor O oh, all my heart woos, wife to my creating thought, would neither hear me, were I pleading, plead nor do I, I, weary of idol of being, but by where wars are rife. I am in Ireland now, now I am at a third remove, not but in all removes I can. Kind love, both give and get. Only what word wisest my heart breeds, Dark heaven's baffling ban, Bars or hell's spell thwarts, This to hoard unheard, Heard unheeded, Leaves me a lonely began. Poem 45 I wake and feel the fell of dark, not day. I wake and feel the fell of dark, not day. What hours, oh, what black hours we have spent this night. What sights you, heart, saw, ways you wet, and more must. In yet longer lights delay With witness I speak this Where I say Hours I mean years Mean life And my lament Is cries countless Cries like dead letters sent To dearest him That lives alas Away I am gone I am heartburn, God's most deep decree, bitter would have me taste, my taste was me, bones built in me, flesh filled, blood brimmed the curse, self yeast of spirit, a dull though sours, I see the lost are like this. And they're scorched to be, as I am mine, their sweating selves, but worse. Poem 46 Patience, hard thing, the hard thing but to pray. Patience, hard thing, the hard thing but to pray, but bid for, patience is. Patience who asks. Wants war, wants wounds, Weary his times, his task, To do without, take tosses and obey. Rare patience roots in these, And these away, nowhere. Natural hearts ivy, patience mass, Are ruins of wrecked past purpose. There she basks purple eyes, 
and seas of liquid leagues all day. We hear our hearts grate on themselves. It kills to bruise them dear. Yet the rebellious wills of us we do bid God bend to him even so. And where is he who more and more distills delicious kindness? He is patient. Patience fills his crisp combs. And that Comes those ways we know. Poem 47 My own heart let me have more, Have pity on, let. My own heart let me have more, Have pity on, Let me live to my sad self Hereafter, kind, charitable, Not live this tormented mind, with his tormented mind tormenting yet, I cast for comfort I can no more get By groping round my comfortless Than blind eyes in their dark Can day or thirst can find thirst All in all, in all a world of wet Soul, self, come, poor Jack, self I do advise you, jaded, let be, Call off thoughts a while elsewhere, Leave comfort root room, Let joy sighs at God knows when to God knows what, Who smiles not wrong, see you, Unforeseen times rather, as skies, between pine mountains Lights a lovely mile Poem 48 That nature is a Heraclitian fire And of the comfort of the resurrection Clown puffball Torn tufts Tossed pillows Flaunt forth Then Chevillon in air built Thoroughfare Heaven roisters in gay gangs they throng, they glitter in marches. Down rough cast, down dazzling whitewash, wherever an elm arches. Shiva lights and shadow tackle, in long lashes, lace, lance, and pear. Delightfully the bright wind. Boisterous ropes, wrestles, beats earth bare Of yester tempest creases In pool and rut peel parches Squandering ooze to squeeze dough Crossed, dust, staunches, starches Squadroned mass and man marks Tread mire Oil there, foot fretted in it, million fueled, nature's bonfire burns on, but quench her bonniest, dearest to her, her clearest selved spark, man, how fast his fire dimmed, his mark on mine is gone, both are in an unfathomable. All is an enormous dark drowned. O oh, pity and indignation, man shape that shone sheer off, disseveral a star. Death blots black out, nor mark is any of him at all so stark. But vastness blurs and time beats level. Enough, the resurrection, a heart's clarion, away griefs gasping, joyless days, dejection. Cross my foundering deck, shown a beacon, an eternal beam, flesh fade, and mortal trash fall to the residuary worm. World's wildfire, 
leaf but ash in a flash at a trumpet crash i am all at once what christ is since he was what i am and this jack joke poor pot's heard patch matchwood immortal diamond is a mortal diamond. Poem 49 St. Alphonsus Rodriguez Lay Brother of the Society of Jesus Honors flashed off exploit, so we say, and those strokes once that gashed flesh or galled shield should down that time now, trumpet now that field and on the fighter forge his glorious day on christ they do and on the martyr may but be the war within the brand we wield unseen the heroic breast not outward steeled earth hears no hurdle then from fiercest fray yet god that hews mountain and continent, earth all out, who with trickling increment, veins violets and tall trees, makes more and more, could crowd career with conquest, while there went those years and years by a world without event that in. Mahor Galfonso watch the door. Poem 50 Thou art indeed just, Lord, if I contend. Hustu scidem tu es, Domine, si disputem tecum, perum tamem justa loquara te, quare mia in biorum prosperatur in sera. Thou art indeed just, Lord, if I contend with thee. But, sir, so what I plead is just. Why do sinners' ways prosper? And why must disappointment all I endeavor end? Wert thou my enemy, O thou my friend, How wouldst thou worse, I wonder, than thou dost defeat? Thwart me, O oh, the sots and thralls of lust, do in spare hours more thrive than I that spend, sir, life upon thy cause. See, banks and breaks now leave it how thick, laced they are again with fretty shervil. Look. And fresh wind shakes them. Birds build, but not I build. No, but strain. Time's eunuch, and not breed one work that wakes. Mine, O thou Lord of life, send my roots rain. Poem 51 To R. B. The fine delight the father's thought, the strong spur, live in lancing like the blowpipe flame, breeze once and, quench it faster than it came, leaves yet the mind a mother of a mortal song. Nine months she then, nay years, nine years she long within her wares, bears, Cares and molds the same. The widow of an insight lost, she lives. With aim now known, and hand at work now never wrong. Sweet fire, the sire of muse, my soul needs this. I want the one rapture of an inspiration. Oh, then, if in my lagging lines you miss the roll, the rise, the carol, the creation, my winter world, that scarcely breathes that bliss now, yields you, with some sighs, 
our explanation. End of part six. End of poems eighteen seventy six to eighteen eighty nine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information for how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Polls by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read by Linda Liu. Part 6b. Editor's Notes to Poems 40 to 51. Poem 40. Carrying Comfort. Autograph in H. In three versions. First, deleted draft. Second, a complete version, both on same page, with 38 and 39. Third, with 41 on another sheet. Final, question mark. Revision carried only to end of stanza 1, line 12. Open parentheses, two detached lines on reverse. Close parentheses. Text is this last, with last two lines from the second version. Date must be 1885, and this is probably the sonnet, quote, written in blood, unquote, of which he wrote in May of that year. I have added the title and the hyphen in Heaven hyphen handling. Poem 41. No worst. Autograph in H. On same page as third draft of 40. One undated draft with corrections embodied in the text here. Stanza 1, line 5. At the end are some marks which look like a hyphen and a comma. No title. Poem 42. Tom's Garland. Sonnet. Common rhythm, but with hurried feet. Two codas. Dromore. September 87. With full title, capital A. Another autograph in capital B is identical. In line 9, there is a strong accent on I. Stanza 1, line 10. The capital initial of country is doubtful. Rhythmical marks omitted. The author's own explanation of this poem may be read in a letter written to me from Dublin, February 10th, 88. Quote, I laughed outright and often, but very sardonically, to think you and the canon could not construe my last sonnet, that he had a right to you for a crib. It is plain I must go no further on this road. If you and he cannot understand me, who will? Yet, declaimed, the strange constructions would be dramatic and effective. Must I interpret it? It means, then, that as St. Paul and Plato and Hobbes and everybody says, the commonwealth or well-ordered human society is like one man, a body with many members in each its function, some higher, some lower, but all honorable, from the honor which belongs to the whole. The head is the sovereign, which has no superior but God, and from heaven receives his or her authority. We must then imagine this head as bare, see St. Paul much on this, and covered, so to say, only with the sun and stars, of which the crown is a symbol, which is an ornament but not a covering, it has an enormous hat or skull cap, the vault of heaven, the foot is a day laborer, and this is armed with hobnail boots, because it has to wear and be worn by the group which again is symbolical for its navvies or day laborers who, on the great scale or in gangs and millions, mainly trench, tunnel, blast, and in other ways disfigure, quote, mammoth, unquote, the earth 
and, on a small scale, singly and superficially stamp it with our footprints, and the, quote, garlands, unquote, of nails they wear are therefore the visible badge of the place they fill, the lowest in the commonwealth. But this place still shares the common honor, and if it wants one advantage, glory or public fame, makes up for it by another, ease of mind, absence of care, and these things are symbolized by the gold and the iron garlands. Oh, once explained how clear it all is, therefore the scene of the poem is laid at evening, when they are giving over work, and one after another pile their picks, with which they earn their living, and swing off home, knocking sparks out of Mother Earth, not now by labor and a choice, but by the mere footing, being strong shod, and making no hardship of hardness, taking all easy, and so to supper and bed. Here comes a violent but effective hyperbation or suspension, in which the action of the mind mimics that of the laborers, surveys his lot, low but free from care. Then by a sudden strong act, throws it over the shoulder, or tosses it away as a light matter, the witnessing of which light-heartedness makes me indignant with a fool's radical levelers. But presently I remember that this is all very well for those who are in, however low in, the common wealth and share in any way the common weal, but that the curse of our times is that many do not share it, that they are outcasts from it and have neither security nor splendor, that they share care with a high and obscurity with a low, but wealth or comfort with neither. And this state of things, I say, is the origin of loafers, tramps, corner boys, roughs, socialists, and other pests of society, and I think that it is a very pregnant sonnet, and in point of execution very highly wrought. Too much so, I am afraid. G. M. H. Unquote. Poem 43. Harry Plowman. Dromore, September 1887. Autograph in capital A. Autograph in capital B has several emendations, written over without deletion of original. Text is capital B with these corrections, which are all good. Line 10. Features is a verb. Line 13. Apostrophe S is his. I've put a colon at plow in place of author's full stop for the convenience of reader. Line 15 equals his lily locks wind laced. Quote Saxo Sarah hyphen, comminuit, hyphen, brum, unquote. Line 17. Them, these, capital A. In the last three lines the grammar intends, quote, how his churl's grace governs the movement of his booted, open parentheses, in bluff hide, close parentheses, feet, as they are matched in a race with a wet shining furrow overturned by the share. G.M.H. thought well of the sonnet and wrote on September 28, 1887, quote, I have been touching up some old sonnets you have never seen and have within a few days done the whole of one, I hope, very good one, and most of another. The one finished is a direct picture of a plowman, without afterthought. But when you read it, let me know if there is anything like it in Walt Whitman, as perhaps there may be, and I should be sorry for that. Unquote. And again on October 11th, 87. Quote, I will enclose a sonnet on Harry Plowman, in which burden lines, they might be recited by a chorus, are freely used. There is in this very heavily loaded sprung rhythm 
a call for their employment. The rhythm of this sonnet, which is altogether for recital and not for perusal, as by nature verse should be, is very highly studied. From much considering it, I can no longer gather any impression of it. Perhaps it will strike you as intolerably violent and artificial. Unquote. And again on November six, eighty seven. Quote, I want Harry Plowman to be a vivid figure before the mind's eye. If he is not that, the sonnet fails. The difficulties are of syntax, no doubt. Dividing a compound word by a clause sandwiched into it was a desperate deed, I feel and I do not feel that it was an unquestionable success. Unquote. Poems 44, 45, 46, 47 These four sonnets, together with number 56, are all written undated in a small hand, on the two sides of a half-sheet of common sermon paper, in the order in which they are here printed. They probably date back as early as 1885, and maybe all, or some of them, those referred to in a letter of September 1st, 1885. Quote, I shall shortly have some sonnets to send you, five or more. Four of these came like inspirations unbidden and against my will, and in the life I lead now, which is one of a continually jaded and harassed mind. If in any leisure I try to do anything, I make no way, nor with my work. Alas, but so it must be. Unquote. I have no certain nor single identification of date. Poem 44 To Seem the Stranger H. With corrections which my text embodies. Stanza 1, line 14 Began I have no other explanation than to suppose an omitted relative pronoun, like Hero Savest, in poem 17. The sentence would then stand for, quote, Leaves me a lonely, open parentheses, one who only, close parentheses, began, unquote. No title. Poem 45 I wake and feel H With corrections which text embodies No title Poem 46 Patience As 45 Stanza 1 Line 2 Patience is The initial capital is mine And the comma after Ivy In line 6 no title. Poem 47 My Own Heart As 45 Stanza 1, line 6 I have added the comma after Comfortless That word has the same grammatical value as Dark in the following line Quote I cast for comfort Open parentheses Which Close parentheses. I can no more find in my comfortless. Open parentheses. World. Close parentheses. Than a blind man in his dark world. Unquote. Stanza 1, line 10. Manuscript accents. Let. Lines 13 and 14. The text here from a good correction, separately written, open parentheses, as far as mountains, close parentheses, on the top margin of poem 56. There are therefore two writings of between pi, a strange word in which pi apparently makes a compound verb with between meaning, quote, as the sky seen between dark mountains is brightly dappled, unquote, the grammar such as inner variegates would make. This word might have delighted William Barnes if the verb, quote, to pie, 
unquote, existed. It seems not to exist, and to be forbidden by homophonic absurdities. Poem 48 Heraclitian Fire Sprung rhythm with many outrides and hurried feet. Sonnet with two, sick, codas. July 26, 1888 County of Dublin The last sonnet, this provisional only. Autograph in capital A. I found no other copy nor trace of draft. The title is from capital A. Line 6 Construction obscured rut peel may be a compound word manuscript uncertain line eight question mark omitted relative pronoun if so equals quote, the man marks a treadmire toil foot fretted in it unquote. manuscript does not hyphen nor quite join up foot with fretted Line 12. Manuscript has no sacerdotal mark. On August 18, 88, he wrote, quote, I will now go to bed. The more so I am going to preach tomorrow and put plainly to a highland congregation of McDonald's, Macintoshes, Macalops, and the rest what I am putting not at all so plainly to the rest of the world, or rather to you and Canon Dixon. In a sonnet in sprung rhythm with two codas. Unquote. And again on September twenty fifth, eighty eight. Quote, Lately I sent you a sonnet on the Heraclitian fire, in which a great deal of early Greek philosophical thought was distilled. But the liquor of the distillation did not taste very Greek, did it? The effect of studying masterpieces is to make me admire and do otherwise. So it must be on every original artist to some degree, on me to a marked degree. Perhaps then more reading would only refine my singularity, which is not what you want. Unquote. Note that the sonnet has three codas, not two. Poem 49, Alfonso's. Text from autograph with title. And, quote, Upon the first falling of his feast after his canonization, unquote, in capital B, an autograph in capital A, sent October 3rd from Dublin asking for immediate criticism, because the sonnet had to go to Majorca. Quote, I ask your opinion of a sonnet written to order on the occasion of the first feast since his canonization proper of St. Alfonso Rodriguez a lay brother of our order, who for forty years acted as hall porter to the College of Palma in Majorca. He was, it is believed, much favored by God with heavenly light, and much persecuted by evil spirits. The sonnet, I say it snorting, aims at being intelligible. Unquote. And on October ninth, eighty eight, quote, I am obliged for your criticisms. Quote, Contents of which noted, unquote, indeed acted on. I have improved the sestet. Open parentheses. He defends, quote, Hugh, unquote. Close parentheses. At any rate, whatever is markedly featured in stone, or what is like stone, is most naturally said to be home. And to shape itself means in old english to hew and the hebrew bara to create even properly means to hew but life and living things are not naturally said to be home and their growth is by trickling increment the open parentheses first close parentheses lie now stands quote, Glory is a flame off exploit, so we say. Unquote. Poem fifty Hustusus etc. Jeremiah chapter twelve verse one Open parentheses for title Close parentheses 
March 17, 89. Autograph in capital A. Similar autograph in capital B, which reads line 9. Sir, life on thy great cause. Text from capital A, which seems later, being written in the peculiar faint ink of the corrections in capital B, and embodying them. Early drafts in H. Poem 51. To R. B. April 22nd, 89. Autograph in capital A. This, the last poem sent to me, came on April 29th. No other copy but the working drafts in H. In line 6, the word molds was substituted by me for combs of original when the sonnet was published by Miles. And I leave it, having no doubt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or for how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Poems by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read by Linda Liu. Part 7. Unfinished Poems and Fragments. Poem 52. Summa. The best ideal is a true and other truth is none. All glory be ascribed to the holy three in one. Poem 53 What being in rank old nature should earlier have that breath been? What being in rank old nature should earlier have that breath been? That here, personal, tells off these hearts' songs powerful peals. A bush-browed, beetle-browed billow is it, with a south-westerly wind blustering, with a tide rolls reels of crumbling, foreth-foundering, thundering all surfy seas in, seen underneath their glassy barrel of a fairy green or a jaunting, vaunting, vaunting, assaulting, trumpet-telling. Poem 54 On the portrait of two beautiful young people, a brother and sister. Oh, I admire and sorrow, the heart's eye grieves discovering you, dark tramblers, tyrant ears. A juice rides rich through bluebells in vine leaves, and beauty's dearest, veriest vein is tears. Happy the father, mother of these, too fast, not that, but thus far all with frailty, blessed in one fair fall, bought for times after cast, creatures all have. Hope, hazard, interest. And are they thus, the fine, the fingering beams, their young, delightful hour? Do feature down that pleaded else, like day dissolved dreams, or ringlet race on burling barrel brown? She leans on him with such contentment fond, as well the sister sits. Would well the wine, his looks, the soul's own letters, see beyond, gaze on, and fall directly forth on life. But ah, bright forelock, cluster that you are, a favored make in mind and health and youth, where lies your landmark, sea mark? or soul star, there's none but truth can stead you. Christ is truth, there's none but good can be good, both for you and what sways with you. 
Maybe the sweet maid, none good but God. A warning waved to one once that was found wanting when good weighed. Man lives that list, that leaning in the will, no wisdom can forecast by gauge or guess. The selfless self of self, most strange, most still, fast furled and all foredrawn to know or yes. Your feast of that most in you earnest eye may but call on your banes to more carubes. Worst will the best. What worm was here, we cry, to have havoc popped so. See, the hung heavenward bows. Enough. Corruption was a world's first woe. What need I strain my heart beyond my ken? Oh, but I bear my burning witness, though, against the wild and wanton work of men. Poem 55 The sea took pity, it interposed with doom. The sea took pity, it interposed with doom. I have tall daughters dear that heed my hand. Let winter wed one, sow them in her womb, and she shall child them on the new world strand. Poem 56, Ash Bows A. Not of all my eyes see, Wandering on the world, Is anything a milk to the mind, So, so sighs deep poetry to it, As a tree whose boughs break in the sky. Say it is ash bows, whether on a December day unfurled fast, or they in clammyish lash tender combs creep apart wide and new nestle at heaven most high. They touch heaven, taper on it, how their talons sweep the smoldering enormous winter welkin. May melts blue and snow white through them, a fringe and fray of greenery. It is old earth groping towards a steep heaven, whom she childs us by. Variant from line seven. B. They touch, they taper on it, over on it, here, there hurled, with talons weep the smoldering, enormous winter welkin. Aye, but more cheer is when May melts blue with snow white Through their fringe and fray of greenery, And old earth gropes for Grass that steep heaven with it, Whom she childs things by. Poem 57 Hope holds to Christ the mind's own mirror out. Hope holds to Christ the mind's own mirror out, To take his lovely likeness more and more. It will not well, so she would bring about An ever brighter burnish than before, And turns to wash it from her welling eyes. And breathes the blots of all with sighs and sighs. Her glass is blessed, but she, as good as blind, Holds till hand aches and wonders what is there. Her glass drinks light, she darkles down behind, All of her glorious gainings unaware. I told you that she turned her mirror dim Between whiles, but she sees herself, not him. Poem 58, St. Winifred's Well Act 1, Scene 1 
into Tareth from riding, Winifred following. Tareth, what is it, Gwen, my girl? Why do you hover and haunt me? Winifred, you came by Carowise, sir. I came by Carowise. There, some messenger there might have met you from my uncle. Your uncle met the messenger, met me, and this the message. Lord Benno comes tonight. Tonight, sir. Soon now. Therefore have all things ready in his room. There needs but little doing. Let what there needs be done. Stay with him one companion, his deacon, Dervan Warm. Twice over must the welcome be, but both will share one cell. This was good news, Guinrovi. Ah, yes. Why get thee gone, then? Tell thy mother I want her. Exit Winifred. No man has such a daughter. The fathers of the world call no such maiden mine. The deeper grows her dearness, and more and more times laces round and round my heart. The more some monstrous hand gropes with clammy fingers there, tampering with those sweet vines, draws them out, strains them, strains them. Meantime some tongue cries, What, Tareth, what, thou poor fond father? How in this bloom, this honeysuckle, that rides the air so rich about thee, is all, all sheared away thus. Then I sweat for fear, or else a funeral, and yet tis not a funeral, some pageant which takes tears, and I must foot with feeling that alive or dead my girl is carried in it, endlessly goes marching through my mind. What sense is this? It has none. This is too much the father, nay, the mother, fanciful. I here forbid my thoughts to fool themselves with fears. Enter Gwenlo. Act Two. Scene. A wood ending in a steep bank over a dry dean. Winifred, having been murdered within, re-enter Caradoc with a bloody sword. Caradoc. My heart, where have we been? What have we seen, my mind? What stroke has Caradoc's right arm dealt? What done? Head of a rebel struck off it has, written upon lovely limbs, in bloody letters, lessons of earnest, of revenge, monuments of my earnest, records of my revenge. On one that went against my whereas I had warned her, warned her, well she knew, I warned her of this work, what work, what harm's done, there is no harm done, not yet, perhaps we struck no blow, Gwenrovy lives perhaps, to make believe my mood was, mock, why am I think so but here? Here is a workman from his day's task sweats. Wiped, I am sure this was. It seems not well, for still, still the scarlet swings and dances on the blade. So be it. Thou steel, thou butcher, I can scour thee, fresh burnish thee, sheathe thee in thy dark lair. These drops never, never, Never in their blue banks again. The woeful Craddock, or the woeful word. Then what? What have we seen? Her head, sheared from her shoulders, fall, and lapped in shining hair, roll to the bank's edge, then down the beetling banks, like water in waterfalls. It stooped and flashed and fell and ran like water away. Her eye, Oh, and her eyes, and all her beauty and sunlight to it is a pit, den, darkness, foam falling is not fresh to it, 
rainbow by it, not beaming. In all her body, I say, no place was like her eyes. No peace matched those eyes, kept most part much cast down, but being lifted, immortal, of immortal brightness. Several times I saw them, thrice or four times turning. Round and round they came and flashed towards heaven. Oh, there, there they did appeal. Therefore airy vengeances are afoot. Heaven vault fast purpling portends, and what first lightning any instant falls means me, and I do not repent. I do not, and I will not repent. Not repent. The blame bear who aroused me. What I have done violent, I have like a lion done, lion like done. Honoring an uncontrolled royal wrathful nature, mantling passion in a grandeur, crimson grandeur. Now be my pride, then perfect, all one piece. Henceforth, in a wide world of defiance, Caradoc lives alone, loyal to his own soul, laying his own law down, no law nor lord now curb him forever. O oh, daring, O oh, deep insight, what is virtue, valor, only the heart valiant, and right, only resolution, will. His will unwavering, who, like me, Knowing his nature to the heart home, Nature's business, Dispatches with no flinching. What will flesh, O oh, can flesh, Second this fiery strain? Not always, oh no, no. We cannot live this life out. Sometimes we must weary, And in this darksome world What comfort can I find? Down this darksome world, comfort where can I find? When does light I quenched its rose, times one rich rose, my hand by her bloom, fast by her fresh, her fleeced bloom, hideous dash down, leaving earth a winter withering with no now, no Gwenroe. I must miss her most. That might have spared her were it but for passion's sake. Yes, to hunger and not have, yet hope on for. To storm and strive and be at every assault fresh foiled, worse flung, deeper disappointed, the turmoil and the torment it has, I swear, a sweetness, keeps a kind of joy in it, a zest, an edge. In ecstasy next after sweet success I am not left even this I all my being have hacked it half with her neck one part reason self disposal choice of better or worse way is corpse now cannot change my other self this soul life's quick this kind this keen self-feeling, With dreadful distillation of thoughts sour as blood, Must all day long taste murder. What do now, then, do? Nay, deed bound I am. One deed treads all down here, cramps all doing. What do not yield, not hope, not pray, despair? I that, brazen and despair out, brave all, and take what comes, as here this rabble is come, whose bloods I reck no more of, no more rank with hers, than sewers with sacred oils, mankind that mobs comes, comes. Enter a crowd among them, Tareth, Gwenlo, Wano. After Winifred's raising from the dead and the breaking out of the fountain. Boino. 
Oh, now all skies are blue, now all seas are salt, while rushy rains shall fall, while brooks shall fleet from fountains, while sick men shall cast sighs, their sweet health all despairing, while blind men's eyes shall thirst after daylight, droughts of daylight. Or deaf ears shall desire that lip music that's lost upon them. While cripples are, while lepers, dancers in dismal limb dance, fallers in dreadful froth pits, water fares wild, stone, palsy, cancer, cough, long wasting, womb not bearing, rupture. Running sores, what more, in brief. In burden, as long as men are mortal, and God merciful, so long did this sweet spot, this leafy lean over, this dry dean, now no longer dry nor dumb, but moist and musical, with the uproll and the down carol of day and night delivering water, which keeps thy name. For not in rock written, but in pale water, frail water, wild, rash, and reeling water, that will not wear or print, that will not stain a pen. Thy venerable record, virgin, is recorded. Here to this holy well shall pilgrimages be, not from purple whales only, nor from elmy England. But from beyond seas, Erin, France and Flanders, everywhere, pilgrims, still pilgrims, more pilgrims, still more poor pilgrims. What sights shall be when some that swung, wretches on crutches, their crutches shall cast from them, on heels of air departing, for they go rich as rose leaves hence that loathsome came hither, not now to name even those dear, more divine boons whose haven the heart is. As sure as what is most sure, sure as that spring primroses shall new dapple next year, sure as tomorrow morning, amongst come back again things, Things with a revival, things with a recovery, thy name. End of this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information for how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Polls by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read by Linda Liu. Part 7b. Editor's Notes to Poems 52 through 58. Poem 52. Summa. This poem had, I believe, the ambitious design which its title suggests. What was done of it was destroyed with other things when he joined the Jesuits. My copy is a contemporary autograph of sixteen lines, written when he was still an undergraduate. I give the first four. Capital A. Poem 53. What being? Two scraps in H. I take the apparently later one, and have inserted the comma in line three. Poem 54 On the Portrait, etc. Monastreven, County of Kildare, Christmas 86, Autograph with full title, No Corrections, in capital A, Early Drafts in H. Poem 55 The Sea Took Pity, Undated Pencil Scrap in H. Poem 56, Ash Bows, open parentheses, my title, close parentheses, in H in two versions, first as a curdle sonnet, like 13 and 22, 
on the same sheet with the four sonnets, 44 through 47, and preceding them. Second, an apparently later version in the same meter on a page by itself, with expanded variation from seventh line, making thirteen lines for eleven. I print the whole of the second manuscript, and have put brackets to show what I think would make the best version of the poem. For if the bracketed words were omitted, the original curdle sonnet form would be preserved and carry the good corrections. The uncomfortable I, in the added portion, was perhaps to be worked as a vocative, referring to first line, question mark. Poem 57 Hope Holds In H, a torn, undated scrap which carries a vivid splotch of local color. Line 4 A variant has A growing burnish brighter than Poem 58 St. Winifred GMH began a tragedy on St. Winifred, October 79, for which he subsequently wrote the chorus. Poem 36 above. He was at it again in 1881, and had mentioned the play in his letters, and when, some years later, I determined to write my Feast of Bacchus in six dressed verse, I sent him a sample of it, and asked him to let me see what he had made of the measure. The manuscript which he sent me, April 1st, 1885, was copied, and that copy is a text in this book, from capital A, the original not being discoverable. It may therefore contain copious errors. Twenty years later, when I was writing my Demeter for the lady students at Somerville College, I remembered the first line of Caradoc's soliloquy and made some use of it. On the other hand, the broken line, I read her eyes in my first part of Nero, is proved by day to be a coincidence and not a reminiscence. Caradoc was to, quote, die in This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information for how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Poems by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read by Linda Liu. Part 8. Poem 59. What shall I do for the land that bred me? What shall I do for the land that bred me? Her homes and fields that folded and fed me. Be under her banner and live for her honor. Under her banner I'll live for her honor. Under her banner live for her honor. Not the pleasure, the pay, the plunder, But country and flag, the flag I am under. There is a shilling that finds me willing To follow a banner and fight for honor. We follow her banner, we fight for her honor. Call me England's fame's fond lover, Her fame to keep, her fame to recover. Spend me or end me what God shall send me, But under her banner I live for her honor. Under her banner, we march for her honor. Where is a field I must play the man on? A welcome there, their steel or cannon. Immortal beauty is death with duty. If under her banner, I fall for her honor. Under her banner, we fall for her honor. Poem 60 the times are nightfall, look, their light grows less. The times are nightfall, look, their light grows less. The times are winter, watch, a world undone. They waste, they wither worse. 
they as they run, or bring more or more blaze in man's distress, and I not help, nor word now of success. All is from wreck, here, there, to rescue one, work which to see scarce so much as begun, makes welcome death, does dear forgetfulness. Or what is else? There is your world within. There rid the dragons, root out there the sin. Your will is law in that small commonwealth. Poem 61 Cheery Beggar Beyond Magdalene and by the bridge On a place called there the plain In summer in a burst of summer time, following falls and falls of rain, when the air was sweet and sour of the flown fine flower, of those gold nails and their gay links that hang along the line. The motion of that man's heart is fine, whom want could not make pine, pine that struggling should not sear him, a gift should cheer him, like that poor pocket of pence, poor pence of mine. Poem 62 Dennis, whose motionable, alert, most vaulting wit Dennis, whose motionable, alert, most vaulting wit Caps occasion with an intellectual fit. Yet Arthur is a bowman, his three-heeled timbrel hit the bald and bolt blinking gold when all's done right brooding in the bare butts wincing navel in the sight of the sun poem sixty three the furrow of fresh leaved dog rose down the furrow of fresh leaved dog rose down his cheeks the fourth and flaunting sun had swarred the bout with lion brown before the spring was done. His locks, like all the ravel ropes, end with hempen strands and spray. Fallow, foam fallow, hanks, fallen off their ranks, swung down at a disarray. But like a juicy and jostling shock, of bluebells sheathed in May, or wind-long fleeces on the flock, a day off shearing day. Then over his turned temples, here was a rose, or failing that, rough robin, or five-lipped campion clear, for a beauty bow to his hat, and the sunlight sidled. Like dewdrops, like dandled diamonds, through the sea of the straw of the plate. Poem sixty four, the woodlark. Chivo, chivo, chivio, chi. Where, what can that be? Weedio, weedio. There again, so tiny a trickle of song strain. And all around not to be found For briar, bough, furrow, or green ground Before or behind, or far or at hand Either left, either right, anywhere in the sunlight Well, after all, ah, but hark I am the little woodlark Today the sky is two and two, with white strokes and strains of the blue. Round a ring, around a ring, while I sail, must listen, I sing. The skylark is my cousin, and he is known to men more than me. When the cry within says, Go on, then I go on, till the longing is less, and the good gone. Poem 65 
but down drop if it says stop to the all a leaf of the tree top and after that off the bough i am so very oh so very glad that i do think there is not to be had The blue wheat acre is underneath, and the braided ear breaks out of the sheath. The ear in milk lush the sash, and crushed silk poppies a flash. The blood gush, blade gash, flame rash ruddered, bud shelling or broad shed, tatter tassel tangled, and dingle a dangled, dandy hung dainty head and down the furrow dry sunspurred and ox eye and laced leaved lovely foam tucked fumatory through the velvety wind v winged to the nest snook I balance and buoy with a sweet joy of a sweet joy sweet of a sweet of a sweet joy, of a sweet, a sweet, sweet joy. Poem 65, Moonrise I awoke in the midsummer, not to call night. In the white and the walk of the morning, the moon dwindled and thinned to the fringe of a fingernail held to the candle. Or pairing of paradisiacal fruit, lovely and waning, but lusterless, stepped from the stool, drew back from the barrel of dark Minefa the mountain, a cusp still clasped him, a fluke yet fanged him, entangled him, not quit utterly. This was a prize. The desirable sight, unsought, presented so easily, parted me leaf and leaf, divided me, eyelid and eyelid of slumber. Poem 66. Repeat that, repeat. Repeat that, repeat. Cuckoo, bird, and open ear well. Heart springs delightfully sweet With a ballad, with a ballad A rebound off trundled timber And scoops of the hillside ground Hollow, hollow, hollow ground The whole landscape flushes on a sudden at a sound Poem 67 on a piece of music how all's to one thing wrought. See the simile A and B. Poem 68 The Child is Father to the Man The child is father to the man. How can he be? Words are wild. Suck any sense from that who can. The child is father to the man. No, what the poet did write ran man is father to the child the child is father to the man how can he be the words are wild poem 69 the shepherd's brow fronting forth lightning owns the shepherd's brow fronting forth lightning owns the horror and the havoc and the glory of it Angels fall, they are towers from heaven. A story of just, majestical, and giant groans. But man, we, scaffold of score brittle bones, we breathe from ground-long babyhood to hoary age gasp, whose breath is our memento mori. What base is our viol for tragic tones? He, hand to mouth he lives, and voids with shame. And, 
blazoned in however bold the name. Man Jack the man is, just, his mate a hussy, and I that die these deaths, that feed this flame, that, in smooth spoons, spy life's mask mirrored, tame my tempest there, my fire, and fever fussy. Poem 70 To His Watch Mortal, my mate, Bearing my rock a heart, Warm beat, With cold beat company. Shall I earlier, Or you fail at our force, And lie the ruins of, Rifled, Once a world of art, the telling time our task is, Time's some part, not all, But we were framed to fail and die. One spell, and well that one, There, ah, thereby, is comfort's carol, Of all, or woe's worst smart. Field flown, the departed day no morning brings, saying this was yours with her, but new one, worse, and then that last and shortest. Poem 71 Strike, churl, hurl, cheerless wind, then heltering hail. Strike, churl, hurl, cheerless wind, then, heltering hail, May's beauty massacre, and whispered wild clouds grow out on the giant air. Tell summer no, bid joy back, have at the harvest, keep hope pale. Poem 72 Epithalamian. Hark, hear, hear what I do. Lend a thought now. Make believe we are leaf whelmed somewhere with a hood of some branchy, bunchy, bushy bowered wood. Southern Dean or Lancashire cloth or Devon cleave that leans along the loins of hills where a candy colored where a blue-gold-brown marbled river, boisterously beautiful, between roots and rocks, is danced and dandled, all in froth, and water blow balls down. We are there, when we hear a shout, that the hanging honeysuck, the dog-eared hazels in the cover, makes dither, makes hover, and the riot of a rout of, it must be, boys from the town bathing. It is summer, sovereign good. By there comes a listless stranger. Beckoned by the noise, he drops towards the river. Unseen, sees a bevy of them. How the boys, with dare and with down dolphinry, and bell-bright bodies huddling out our earth-world, air-world, water-world, thorough-hurled, all by turn and turn about. This garland of their gambols flashes in his breast into such a sudden zest of summertime joys that he shies to a pool neighboring, sees that is the best there, Sweetest, freshest, shadowiest, fairy land, silk beach, scrolled ash, packed sycamore, wild witch elm, hornbeam ready overstood by, rafts and rafts of flake leaves light, dealt so, painted on the air, hang as still as hawk or hawk. Moth, as the stars, or as the angels there, 
like the thing that never knew the earth, never off roots, rose. Here he feasts, lovely all is, no more, off with. Down he dings his bleached both, and wool woven wear. Careless these in colored wisp, all lie tumble to. Then with loop locks, board falling, forehead frowning, lips crisp, over finger teasing task, his twiny boots fast he opens, last he off rings, till walk the world he can with bare his feet, and come where lies a coffer, burly all of blocks, built of chance quarried self-quainted rocks and the water warbles over into filleted with glassy grassy quicksilver shivas and shoots and with heaven fallen freshness down from moorland still brims dark or daylight on and on here he will then here he will the fleet Flinty, kind, cold element Let break across his limbs long Where we leave him Frolic, lavish While he looks about him Laughs, swims Enough now Since the sacred matter that I mean I should be wronging longer Leaving it to float Upon this only gambling An echo of earth, no what is the delightful dean, wedlock, what the water, spousal love? Father, mother, brothers, sisters, friends, into fairy trees, wild flowers, wood ferns, ranked round the bower. Poem 73 Thee, God, I come from, to thee go. Thee, God, I come from, to thee go. All day long I like fountain flow, From thy hand out, swayed about, Mote-like in thy mighty glow. What I know of thee I bless, As acknowledging thy stress, on my being and as seeing something of thy holiness. Once I turned from thee and hid, bound on what thou hadst forbid, sow the wind I would, I sinned, I repent of what I did. Bad I am, but yet thy child, Father, be thou reconciled. Spare thou me, since I see with thy might that thou art mild. I have life before me still, and thy purpose to fulfill. Yea, a debt to pay thee yet, help me, sir, and so I will. But thou biddest, and just thou art, me show mercy from my heart. Towards my brother, every other man my mate and counterpart. Poem 74 To him who ever thought with love of me. To him who ever thought with love of me, or ever did for my sake some good deed, I will appear looking such charity. In kind compassion at his life's last need that he will out of hand and heartily repent he sinned and all his sins be freed. End of part A. End of unfinished.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information for how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Polls by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read by Linda Liu. Part 8b. Editor's Notes to Poems 59 through 74. Poem 59. What shall I do? Sent me in a letter with his own melody and a note on the poem. Quote, this is not final, of course. Perhaps the name of England is too exclusive. Unquote. Date, Klongaur. August 1885. Capital A. Poem 60. The Times are Nightfall. Revised and corrected draft in H. The first two lines are corrected from the original opening in old syllabic verse. The times are nightfall, and the light grows less. The times are winter, and a world undone. Poem 61 Cheery Beggar Undated draft with much correction in H. Text is the outcome. Poem 62 and 63 these are my interpretation of the intention of some unfinished, disordered verses on a sheet of paper in H. In 63, line 1, furl, is, I think, unmistakable. An apparently rejected earlier version had soft childhoods, Carmen do drift down. Poem 64, The Woodlark. Draft on one sheet of small note paper in H fragments in some disorder. The arrangement of them in the text satisfies me. The word sheath is printed for sheath of manuscript, and sheath recurs in corrections. Dating of July 5th, 76. Poem 65. Moonrise. June 19th, 1876. H. Note at foot shows intention to rewrite with one stress more in the second half of each line. And the first is thus rewritten, quote, In the white of the dusk, in the walk of the morning, unquote. Poem 66, Kaku, from a scrap in H without date or title. Poem 67, It being impossible to satisfy myself, I give this manuscript in facsimile as an example. Lowercase a and lowercase b. Poem 68. The child is father. From a newspaper cutting with another very poor comic trollet sent me by G.M.H. They are signed B.R.A.N. His comic attempts were not generally so successful as this. Poem 69. The shepherd's brow. In H, various consecutive full drafts on the same sheet as 51, and date April 3rd, 89. The text is what seems to be the latest draft, and has no corrections. Thus, this date is between poem 50 and 51. It might be argued that the sonnet has the same right to be recognized as a finished poem, with the sonnets 44 through 47. But those had several years' recognition, whereas this must have been thrown off one day in a cynical mood, which he could not have wished permanently to intrude among his last serious poems. Poem 70. To his watch. H. On a sheet by itself. Apparently a fair copy with corrections embodied in this text, except that the original eighth line, which is not deleted, is preferred to the alternative suggestion. Is sweetest comforts carol, or worst woes smart? Poem 71 Strike, Churl H. On same page with a draft of part of poem 45, stanza one, line four. Have at is a correction for aim at. This scrap is some evidence for the earlier dating of the four sonnets. Poem 72 Empathalamian Four sides of penciled rough sketches and five sides of quarto-first draft 
on quote, Royal University of Ireland unquote, candidate's paper as if GMH had written it while supervising an examination fragments in disorder with erasers and corrections undated H the text which omits only two disconnected lines is my arrangement of the fragments and embodies the latest corrections was to have been an ode on the occasion of his brother's marriage, which fixes the date as 1888. It is mentioned in a letter of May 25, whence the title comes. I have printed Dean, D-E-N-E, -E, for Dean, D-E-A-N, in two places. In stanza 1, line 9, of poem, Cover, equals covert which should be in text as gmh never spelt phonetically stanza one line eleven of maybe at manuscript uncertain stanza one line thirty eight shoots is i think a noun poem seventy three the god i come from Unfinished draft in H. Undated, probably 85. On same sheet with first draft of poem 38. Stanza 1, line 2. Day long. Manuscript has two words with accent on. Day. Stanza 1, line 17. Above the words, before me. The words, left with me are written as alternative, but text is not deleted. All the rest of this hymn is without question. In stanza 1, line 19, Yea, is right. After the verses printed in text, there is some versified credo, intended to form part of the complete poem, thus, Jesus Christ sacrificed on the cross. Molded he in maiden's womb, Lived and died and from the tomb, Rose in power and his hour, Judge that comes to deal our doom. Poem 74 To him who Text is an unaligned version Among working drafts in age. Line 6 Freed Equals Got rid of Banished the sense of the word is obsolete. It occurs twice in Shakespeare. Compare Cymbeline, Act 3, Scene 6, Line 79. Quote, he rings at some distress. Would I could free it. Unquote. Finis. End of part.